Commission August 14th, 2020 remote meeting has started. All right. Mr. Ambrose, we are ready to begin. Thank you, um, moderator. I want to welcome everyone to the August 14th, 2020 regular meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. This meeting is being held by teleconference pursuant to the governor's executive order number N2920 and the 12th supplement to the mayoral proclamation declaring the existence of a local emergency dated February 25th, 2020. Before we proceed further, I'd like to ask Commission staff member Ronald Contreras, who is acting as our moderator, to explain some procedures for today's remote meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The meeting is of the meeting, the minutes of this meeting will reflect that due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect commissioner members, city employees, and the public, the meeting rooms of City Hall are closed. However, commission members and staff will put will be participating in today's meeting remotely. This precaution is taken pursuant to the various local, state, and federal orders, declarations, and directives. Commission members will attend the meeting through video conference and participate in the meeting to the same extent as if they were physically present. Please note that today's meeting will not be live cablecast by SFGov TV until the adjourn adjournment of one of the two Board of Supervisors meetings. However, today's meeting will be shown live in the WebEx application and streamed live online at sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Once again, sfgovtv.org backslash ethics live. Public comment will be available on each item on this agenda. Member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone call by calling 1-415-655-0001 and or 1-408-418-9388. Again, the phone number is 1-415-655-0001 and or 1-408-418. 9388. Access code to this is 1460568750. Again, access code 1460568750. Once you've entered that access code, you will be that was followed by a pound sign and then press pound again to join as an attendee. We apologize that previously WebEx only offered a 408 number. You will hear a beep when you are connected to the meeting. You will automatically be muted and in, in listening mode only. When your item of interest comes up, dial star 3 to raise your hand and to be added to the public comment line. You will then hear you have raised your hand to ask a question. Please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Ensure that you are in a quiet location before you speak. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link to prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You will hear staff say, welcome caller. You are encouraged to state your name clearly. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the public comment line, press star three again. You will hear the system say, you have lowered your hand. Once your three minutes have expired, staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. Attendees who wish to speak during other public comment periods may stay on the line and listen for the next public comment opportunity and should raise their hands to enter the public comment line by pressing star three when their next item of interest comes up. Public comment may also be submitted in writing and will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Written comments should be sent to ethics.commission at sfgov.org. 
Once again, that's ethics.commission at sfgov.org. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. The gavel down. And uh, moderator, if you wanted to call the roll, please. Commissioners, please unmute your microphone so that you can verbally state your presence at today's meeting after your name is called. Chair Ambrose? Present. Commissioner Bush? Present. Commissioner Chu? Present. Vice Chair Lee? Present. Commissioner Smith? Present. Madam Chair, with all five members present and accounted for, and accounted for, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. I um, want to uh, express my appreciation to the staff for bringing us all together remotely. Um, I know um, it's a challenge, not just for us. I worry, too, that it's a challenge for our viewing public. Um, one of the things that I was discussing with another commissioner is just the concern that um, the only access that people have is over the internet, really. And with the public libraries closed, I'm just wondering um, if staff could look into whether or not the city has any, I don't know, viewing centers or loaner laptops for, for people because um, it does seem like we're going to be in this um, world for a while. And the idea that um, the only way that you can participate in government is through a computer with, as we all have seen here, really good Ethernet or Wi-Fi and audio service is, is something that I want us to, to just be conscious of and see whatever we can do to, to help. Um, in the meantime, I just want to make a friendly reminder to commissioners and participants today that you mute your microphone when you're not speaking so we don't get a lot of audio feedback. And with that, I'm going to call agenda item number two. So agenda item two is public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. Members of the public who are already online and wish to speak should now, now dial star three if you've not already done so to be added to the public comment line. Moderator, can you please proceed with public comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on agenda item number two remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. If you joined the meeting earlier to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get into line to speak. If you have not already, please press star three. It's, it's important that you press star three only once to enter the queue. After pressing it again, we'll move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you, and when it's your turn to speak, so it's, oh, excuse me, <laughs> the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak, so it's important that you call from a quiet location. Please address your comments to the commission as a whole and not to individual members. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are any callers in the queue. If you have just joined the meeting, we are currently on agenda item number two, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been muted. So we're going to wait for a few seconds to see if there are any speakers. That is correct, ma'am. For all those patiently waiting, please know that we are just waiting 90 seconds. We're um, halfway there.
Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. All right, thank you, moderator. Um, public comment on item two then is now closed. And I'm going to call um, items from the consent calendar. This is agenda items three and four on your agenda notice. Uh, item three is draft minutes for the Ethics Commission's July 10th, 2020 regular meeting. Um, and item four is a proposed stipulation decision and order in the matter of Hillary Ronan for supervisor 2016, Hillary Ronan and Stacey Owens SFEC complaint number 1617-086. Um, moderator, if you can explain um, the call for public comment, please. If any members of the public intend to offer public comment for any of the consent items, they should dial in now and enter star three to be added to the public comment queue. Items three and four are on consent. These items are considered routine. If a commissioner objects, an item can be removed and considered separately. So does any commission member wish to sever any of the items from consent and call for a separate discussion? Seeing no um, such request, I am going to... Um, I was making a request. Oh, you were? I, 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 see I, had, I was trying to raise my hand. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry. I don't... You know what? Maybe I... I have you all grouped in a row. I need I need a tutorial again on how to spread you out so I can see your hands. Um, I just it just says participants. I I, I wanted to uh, make a comment on the minutes. Uh, that's and I don't know if that's an objection to sever it, but I I do want to make a, a comment about the minutes. Um, if if it's up to you, I mean, we can call them separately and call roll separately on each item. If you just want to, um, if if you want to make a, um, if you just want to make a comment about it, then we can just hear it um, under the consent calendar. Then I'll just make a comment. But in, in in view of the fact that we're concerned about a disproportionate impact on people without access to the internet to participate in our meetings, the minutes become more important. And so I'm urging that in future, our minutes we provide more detail rather than just sort of an outline so that people get a, a better sense of not only that different people spoke, but what they said and anything related to that. So that's my comment. That's my comment. Okay. Are there any other comments from commissioners before we ask for public comment? I am. Um, all right, then moderator, I'm going to ask you to um, request public comment uh, or provide the instructions for public comment on the consent items. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Ethics Commission is now receiving public comment on consent calendar items three through four remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you join the meeting early to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get in line to speak. If you're not already done so, please press star three. It's important that you press star three only once to enter the queue. After pressing it again, will move you out of the public comment line and back into listening mode. Once you are in the queue and standing by, the system will prompt you when it's your turn to speak. So it's important that you call from a quiet location. Please address your comment to the commission as a whole and not to individual members. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are any callers in the queue. Thank you. So again, we'll have a slight delay here while, while you checks for speakers. Once again, if you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on the consent calendar, agenda items three and four. 
If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. Madam Chair, there are no callers. All right. Um, hopefully our phone lines are working. Um, then I would like to ask for a um, roll call on the consent agenda. If I can get a motion, please. Uh, Commissioner Lee, thank you. And a second. Second. Commissioner Smith uh, seconds the motion. Um, and now the roll call, please. Okay. A motion has been made and seconded, seconded to adopt consent calendar items three through four together. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush, yay? Yeah, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Chu. Yes. Vice Chair Lee. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Chair Ambrose. Uh, yes. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed to the motion, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. And now I'd like to call agenda item five. Discussion of possible action on the Ethics Commission draft annual report for 2019-20. Um, and before you, um, you moderated, before you asked for a public comment, I just wanted to say a few words and then ask Director Pelham to say a few words. Um, I, um, I'm sure all of you have had the opportunity to both look at this draft annual report um, and also to read the budget and legislative analyst recommendations about what we might achieve in the future with a annual report that uh, reflects um, well, actually not reflects, but is more reflective about what we might have accomplished over the course of the year. But in the interests of um, satisfying the charter requirement that the chair and the executive director produce an annual report, I um, wanted to get my homework done. And so I pressed on executive director Pelham that notwithstanding the budget and the performance audit from the controller's office, or I mean from the budget and legislative analysts and everything being remote that we tried to pull together as best we could um, a, a um, overview of what the commission and frankly the city accomplished on the um, ethics issues in this past year. And um, while it's certainly looking for um, comments and recommendations to improve it over the course of the next year, I would ask for your support in approving um, the draft with, again, with any uh, corrections, revisions. Um, I'd especially look to Commissioner Chu since um, this work was accomplished on your watch um, for the, the remainder of uh, the last fiscal year. During my tenure, we were in absentia. so. I can't say I had much to do with that aspect of the of the fiscal year. Anyway, Commissioner Pelham, I'm Commissioner Pelham, Director Pelham, if you have any thoughts or concern. Uh, no, good morning, uh, Chair Ambrose and, and Commission members. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add uh, in greater depth. I did just want to acknowledge and thank uh, both the chair for getting this um, important and overdue ball rolling. And um, I, I think it was a good effort for all of us on staff to take some time to dig in and reflect and collect information about what the commission has been working to accomplish uh, in this past year or so. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to bring it forward. We appreciate the effort that chair uh, you put into that. And we look forward to continuing to evolve this uh, report. Uh, we'll talk about in, in future agenda items on this uh, meeting, but uh, just uh, wanted to provide it for your review today. And uh, as the cover memo notes, the, the uh, bylaws uh, do state that the commission uh, approve a 
annual, an annual report. And so we, we have it here as a draft, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you and to the chair for, for any comments or feedback that you wish to provide at this time. And I was, um, if it's okay with everyone, I was gonna um, elicit uh, commission feedback or comments, corrections, recommendations for future improvement before we go to public comment. So I would um, ask that if any of you um, want to speak, I am now figured out how to get my panel on the side where I can see whether your hand is raised. So um, feel free to raise your hand. All right then, Commissioner Bush, I'm gonna recognize you. Mr. Chu, you'll be next. Uh, Commissioner Bush, you are mute. You make the point, thank you. There you go, very well. So thank you, Chair Ambrose. Uh, I think that one thing that helps quantify the work of the commission is uh, a statistical summary of how many calls were fielded, how many opinions were issued, um, how many enforcement actions took place, and on what basis they were. So if there was a, a simple listing, like a laundry list of those kinds of things, it would give the public a, a better sense of what it is that's going on. The other part of, of uh, the annual report is is really not so much about the Ethics Commission's annual report, but our partnership in the city. So for example, the number of referrals that we send on to the city attorney or the district attorney, uh, the number of referrals that go to various departments uh, so that people have a, a better sense of what's going on. Uh, some reference to the controller's work on whistleblower. I think that what we saw in this past year were questions being raised about uh, the thoroughness of the city's approach to uh, uh, public integrity. And that's why you saw issues such as creating a public advocate for a whistleblower program. So to the extent that next year's annual report could acknowledge that there are other departments that are working on issues that are related to the Ethics Commission, and where we are a partner that would give a better perspective of how we fit in. Thank you. Thank you, I, I appreciate those comments. And I did um, just wanna say, I, I um, had heard your recommendation, which I think is a good one. And I still think that we can pull together as a sort of um, a fact sheet of having a highlights by the numbers. I know personally, I like looking at just, you know, numbers of cases, time to completion, as you point out, the number of opinions, because you can just look really quickly and kind of see the body of work that's that's going on. And I also really like your idea that we bring in our, um, the, our shared responsibility with other uh, departments and elected officials in the city for um, maintaining, you know, ethical standards in San Francisco. So that's something that I will um, keep note of this year so we can make sure and incorporate it in the annual report for the coming year that we're um, enjoying right now. And with that, I'm going to recognize Commissioner Chu, um, uh, Chu and then Commissioner Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose. I, I wanted to uh, echo Commissioner Bush's uh, comments and uh, that was actually my, my uh, feedback as well. So I think adaptive metrics would be uh, very helpful for the public um, as has already been uh, uh, commented on by, by Commissioner Bush. Um, and one of those would be, I think, the Form 700 filing and, um, and, and to, as, as one of the primary tools of, of disclosure for uh, elected and appointed amongst other uh, uh, city employees. Uh, and I don't have a recommendation here, but I have a question for uh, the commission is how much or should we, and if so, how much 
should we reference in terms of the recommendations from the BLA report? Because I think it's also important to note that while we have a, a body of accomplishments and work that has been done and we need to communicate about, I also think that it's an opportunity in the, in the annual report to identify areas of improvement. And I think that the, and I don't wanna get into the, um, the BLA audit results because that's for the up upcoming agenda item but I think there might be an opportunity here, you know, to say that you know one of the reasons why we have um, that we will be doing more, hopefully, uh, is if we could be fully staffed, for example, um, that we have experienced a very high rate of vacancy, um, which is which is um, you know part one of the high, the second highest in the city, um, as as noted in the BLA report. You know, in order to in order to paint not just a picture of you know what what we've accomplished, but also some of the ongoing challenges. Okay. Um, yeah, just um, there is a, a reference at the end of the annual report at the time that the annual report was, um, or the draft annual report was put forward to the commission. We were um, just getting in hand the BLA report. So we, we just from a timing point of view, it, there's simply just a cross reference to it. And maybe in the final version of the annual report, we could certainly include um, online a link to the BLA report and a um, you know specific reference to the date that it was issued you know now that the BLA report is final going going forward and this is going to be an agenda item if not in September then October the specific recommendation in the BLA report is that we have adopted metrics for ourselves in terms of what we want to strive to achieve um, on our, um, you know, numeric uh, performance standards, really, and um, including that of which would be the um, budget and staffing issues, um, because obviously any performance metric that doesn't take into consideration resources doesn't really um, reflect reality. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know we um, there there is a reference to it. It's just that the timing didn't allow for us to embed discussion about the recommendations in consideration of the um, happened in the past year. But and with that, I want to recognize. I'm sorry if you have a follow up. Go ahead. I, I do. Uh, so, yeah, I did see the reference and I understand that there's a timing issue of, of um, and uh, a crossover when, when this was uh, prepared. So, uh, but I, I do, uh, one clarifying question I have is, are we to take action today to approve this in this current form? Or is there an opportunity, for example, as Commissioner Bush has raised, uh, to incorporate additional metrics and uh, other information uh, to give a broader picture of the work that the commission has done and that we could take this up at next month's meeting uh, and approve it for for you know, publication at that time. It, that's for the, up to the commission to decide. Um, so if that, if the idea is that these are, are improvements that um, the commission wants to see in the report before it's adopted and yeah that should be the the motion i would only ask given the um you know the um difficulty of we obviously can't draft it by committee or commission so if there is a motion to make improvements i would ask that they be as specific as possible so that the chair and I mean the chair, so that I and the executive <laughs> director have a really clear path forward about what what is um, what you're looking for, you know, to bring back in September. Um, so, but uh, happy to um, take notes and and try and make those improvements. Okay, thank you. And with that, I need to go back to my. My panel here, um, Commissioner Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to echo um, what my uh, colleagues have said. Uh, I also want to um, thank uh, the director and her staff for putting this uh, uh, document together uh, under these really challenging times. 
uh, specifically, I do uh, want to suggest that in addition to the summary of key highlights on the front, that it starts with what the previous um, speakers have said, a simple chart so that it's easily um, is visible, is visual, so people know that this is what the commission has done. So that's the number one recommendation. And the second thing is, I think that there's so much at uh, attention on uh, especially the auditing part of the commission's um, uh, mandate. And again, this year being a really unique year, I would recommend that the report includes why uh, given the staff reassignment and everything else that some of these um, matrix uh, were slow. Um, so I think that that would be really important because this is a document um, for future reference. So I think it's really important to reference that. Um, it, it isn't a, an excuse, but at least to put it in context. And I also would like to recommend that even though this is an annual report of what we've done, but maybe in the last section to have the unfinished business moving forward, uh, what is the commission going to do? What are our plans to really uh, move forward on things that's been identified, things that have been addressed, um, that these are the plans that we have uh, to continue the efforts next for the next fiscal year. So those are my three recommendations. I think um, so I'm gonna raise my, and on the Commissioner Lee, I, I agree with the, the first two parts on the last one. If we, we're gonna have in September uh, agenda item to revisit the, the uh, policy priority plan in light of whatever we're able to um, obtain from the mayor and the board in the way of budget resources. Um, so just, you know, for myself, I don't know about Director Pelham, but I would be really hard pressed to write in the next 30 days what the commission's agenda is for unfinished business for this coming fiscal year without having the commission actually having resolved the competing priorities and adopted that, which I'm hoping we're gonna do at least in part in September. So mm -hmm. I would, um, I, I, I hear you that it would be nice if we had already knew what we were gonna do going forward, but with the way this year is unfolding with so much uncertainty about whether or not we'll even be able to keep the positions that we have, mm -hmm. I just would be afraid to even take something from a prior, you know, from our last priority policy or our to-do list and, and in my words, say what I thought we were going to do. So I, I would ask that we we set our agenda in September once we know what our our resources are. Um, although I, I certainly agree that we can um, now that we have uh, more information about um, what our staff. I mean about what metrics are and what our staffing problems have been in the past and have confirmation from the BLA report that that, that has indeed been um, a constraint on the commission's performance um, that we can incorporate that um, in the in the report. And I'm looking for, I'm gonna let I just want to you respond, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I don't mean it as setting the agenda for the next year. Uh, what I meant by unfinished business is there are a lot of areas that we've started. Um, and, and I think that it would be a good document to show that hey, we intend to continue this path. And right now is an uncertainty regarding the budget, but at least on record, we recognize that, you know, these are some of the areas that we need to continue to move forward. So I don't mean we're going to set a new agenda for the new year, but on the current um, areas that we're working on, such as the the audit, 
and and everything else um you know you know these are the things that the staff intent while well, the commission intends to um continue and then if for whatever reason you know budgetary constraints or what have you then the next year we can re revisit the back and say we had intended to do all these things unfortunately budgetary constraints um prevented us from doing this so uh, my thing is it sets a record that we just not did not drop it mm -hmm. um that we intend we have every intention of carrying out these um these activities um so i i i don't mean it to be like setting a really set agenda that you know we have no control over but it's existing work that we're doing right now that the public may see that hey there's certain areas for improvement uh, even though we may not know whether we have the resources to do that in the future but at least we recognize that we have work to do yeah so i don't know how we can phrase that but i, I just think that that's an important point for the public to know that we're not just doing things because of um yeah I, I i hear you i again though because you did name one example of the audit i guess my my thought and maybe you've been on the commission a lot longer you might have internalized what our overarching continuing missions are i i i'm just really leery as the scribe for this to say that I would know what to put in that paragraph without more specific direction from the commission. And I guess I had envisioned a more, and I think, you know, commission, I mean, the executive director was also had um, a lot of ideas along these lines in terms of that part of what we would do in the fall is set specific metrics for where where can we go with auditing once we know for example whether or not we're going to get our auditor back from the mm -hmm. disaster service working assignment you know where can we go on form 700 depending on our you know financial resources etc so to put in the annual report for last year what we think we're going to do next year i just to to my mind just again as the scribe i don't i'm not prepared to, to take a shot at what that that might be. But what I really do want to do is put it on the agenda so we can have an actual discussion item by item where mm -hmm. what what is what do we think we can get accomplished in the coming year and have mm -hmm. the commission and the staff come together with a clear understanding. So we're not just setting metrics that other people think it'd be nice that we would accomplish but you know we don't think realistically we're going to be able to get there etc so I, i'm still and if if you all want to give more bullets for things that you want to put in the in the report for what we intend to continue working on then um i guess in my thought too i really think that for between now and november given where we're at with the staff that's been directed to disaster service work given the fact that everyone's remote given the fact that the the assistant director is happily out on maternity leave for the next six months that what what i want the staff to do is really focus on the november election on getting the disclosures um continuing with our enforcement efforts you know really just doing the basic hard you know day-to-day -day work of the of the commission um and uh and then and continuing to fight through the budget process to get as many resources as we possibly can um but anyway and that's what i would say if i was going to say what i i want us to do for the at least the next quarter um so i guess again if if folks can articulate what you think and an agreed upon list of of what we will continue to do then i'm going to write it down and we'll put it in the in the report um because I, I i don't want to guess um and i'm going to go back 
I can't find my raised hand thing, but when okay. you have a moment, I'd like to say something about that. Okay, and then I'm gonna uh, let Commissioner Lee respond and go back to Commissioner Chu. So if you wanna go ahead, Commissioner Bush. Uh, just one way forward, uh, because we all seem to be headed in the same direction, is uh, to append to the annual report a copy of the BLA audit so that it's all in one place. And then secondly, uh, to ask each of our partner agencies, like the controller or the city attorney or the district attorney or DHS, if they have something to add, uh, that they provide us a paragraph. And we put that into the report as well as uh, a separate section, which would be uh, uh, related uh, submissions from partner uh, agencies. And then finally, on the point that Commissioner Lee is just making, I think if you have a, a final paragraph that says uh, uh, to be completed or uh, work underway without enumerating them, but just acknowledging that there are still things that are priorities and the convention will be working on those in the next few months, you pretty well covered uh, a sweep of issues with all of those steps and done so in a way that informs the public that we are not asleep at the wheel. Okay, I wrote that down if, um, and, and now I want to recognize Commissioner Chu. Thank you. Uh, so, if maybe if, if it might be premature, I was just going to uh, offer up a motion that would uh, enumerate and open for feedback from my fellow commissioners, uh, adding some metrics for the, the report, which would be include the number of audits conducted, the preliminary investigations, opened and closed investigations, referrals, Form 700 filings, overall filings, the, the amount of public funds dispersed, uh, and then would, as Commissioner Bush just enumerated, uh, appending the BLA report, uh, as well as any uh, uh, paragraphs or, or uh, written statements from partner agencies uh, uh, to inc incorporate into that report. and. Um, as well as, as Commissioner Bush has, has just noted, uh, a, a very high level paragraph about the continuing work of the commission that this is, we are not resting on our laurels of what we've uh, accomplished to date, but that you know a, a lot of these work streams will continue into the future. It's something that uh, you know, gets to that point without being granular and specific and, and holding us to uh, initiatives that we have not yet prioritized, um, but will in, in the upcoming months. Okay, is that a motion? Yes. All right. Um, and is there a second for that motion? Commissioner Smith. All right. And now if we can have some discussion on that motion, if anyone wants to confirm or um, revise. And if not, then I'm going to go to the moderator and ask for public comment. Commissioner, nobody has their hand up. Is anybody trying to put their hand up? Nope. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Um, and then monitor, monitor, moderator, can you please call for public comment? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue and we do have one right now. For those, of, for those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently on agenda item five Discussion and possible action on Ethics Commission draft annual report for 2019-2020. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You have already, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Okay, Madam Chair, we do have callers in the queue. Give me just a moment here. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, welcome, caller. You, well, yeah, welcome, caller. I'm sorry. You have three minutes, and your three minutes begins now. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Dr. Derek Kerr, a whistleblower. A uh, key recommendation of the legislative analyst's audit of the Ethics Commission is that the outcomes of investigations should be disclosed, particularly whistleblower retaliation claims. Now, in your draft annual report, um, there's a table on page 13 which shows some outcomes of the investigations of whistleblower retaliation claims. However, there's something missing. It doesn't state how many cases were sustained. And I think that the reason that we don't have that information is because the Ethics Commission has never sustained a whistleblower retaliation claim since its founding. That's zero in 27 years. If you would disclose how many cases were sustained or not sustained, it would draw more attention to the fact that these claims are never sustained. And maybe that would give somebody on the commission the impetus to explain why whistleblower retaliation claims are always dismissed by the Ethics Commission. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, caller. I'm sorry, moderator. I'm sorry, chair. <laughs> uh, I'm still, oops, I'm so sorry. Uh, just looking to see if we have any other callers. Uh, Madam Chair, there are no more callers. All right. Um, Thank you, caller, for your comment. Um, public comment is closed, and uh, we have a motion on the floor with a second. So, moderator, can you please call the vote on the um, annual report, uh, revisions and approval of the annual report? So, ju I just want to be clear. We will make those revisions. We'll bring it back in September for final adoption, correct? That's understanding. All right, thank you very much. So if you can call the roll, please. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to, <laughs> sorry, you're gonna have to, if you can chime in and just kind of give me the synopsis again, I'm sorry. Okay, um, oh, you wanna, uh, yeah, motion has been made I'm, not, I'm not gonna ask you to restate the motion. I think it's on the tape um, okay. that commissioner, I think commissioner Chu did a good job of combining Commissioner Lee and Commissioner Bush and her own specific recommendations for edits to the annual report, but I'm not gonna ask her to try and restate that because we will oh, be no. bringing it back for yeah. approval um, and then we'll find out whether or not uh, Director Pelham and I got the correct message. So um, okay. anyway, if you can just okay. go. Call I, will. Okay. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush? Yes. Commissioner Chu? Yes. Vice Chair Lee? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Chair Ambrose? Yes. With five votes in the affirmative and zero votes opposed, the motion is approved unanimously. All right, thank you very much for, for that. And uh, with that, I need to find my place in the script. So um, we are on to Agenda item six and um, agenda item six is a discussion of the budget and legislative analysts performance audit report of the ethics commission conducted at the request of the board of supervisors. I'm going to ask uh, executive director Pelham to uh, lead our discussion here with her staff. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and good morning again, Commissioners. Uh, this item uh, we uh, have on the agenda for you it is the uh, Budget and Legislative Analyst 
performance audit of the Ethics Commission that was issued uh, publicly on Monday, the 10th. And so we wanted to make sure to have the opportunity to have it before you to be able to begin to digest it. It's an 82 page report. Uh, and to also enable the public to start uh, engaging in this discussion uh, as we just did in the prior agenda item about how we can continue to improve our operations and the impact of the mission and the mandate of the Ethics Commission. Um, so we have, a, a, I will in a moment uh, ask uh, our acting deputy director and enforcement director, Jeff Pierce, to, to join me um, on just walking through an overview uh, to recap and refresh everybody about the recommendations that are contained in the report, of which there are 16. Um, but to just provide brief background and context for those who may be new to joining this conversation with the commission, you'll recall that in uh, November of last year, Board uh, President uh, Yee introduced a motion to ask for the budget and legislative uh, analysts to, as a priority in, in fiscal year 20, to conduct a performance audit of the Ethics Commission among its other uh, priority audits for the year. And uh, the entrance, that, that motion was approved by the full board at the end of January. In early February, the BLA uh, auditors met with commission staff, the management to review the scope and the timeframes expected. Um, the work uh, proceeded immediately. We began to uh, prioritize our responses for data collection, uh, document production, interviews, so that we could help the BLA auditors uh, dig into whatever areas they needed to, to assess areas that would help uh, understand where we can continue to improve, and then also to help them stay on time for uh, releasing what they anticipated would be a, an audit um, to the board in uh, late June. At that point, we anticipated that would be during the budget season. Fast forward through the past several months, as you know, the, the COVID pandemic and the public health emergency and the need for offices to operate remotely changed the time frame a bit. Nonetheless, to the credit of the BLA auditors, and I think my thanks to our staff, uh, we also were able to, to, to move that audit to completion. The cover, uh, the cover letter, uh, on the cover memo on the agenda item speaks to that process. The report is attached in full. Uh, and there is also the opportunity for the department to have provided a response. And as your executive director, as we looked at this uh, operationally, uh, I uh, provided a response uh, to the report on behalf of our office. Uh, and that reflects on what we believe uh, to be our full agreement with the recommendations that the BLA auditors have provided in this report. Um, they, they did an extensive amount of work uh, analyzing data and, uh, and providing feedback and insights that are going to be very helpful for us to continue the kind of work that we've laid the foundation for. Uh, my, my response to the, the audit uh, reminds all of us that you know, the commission started on a new journey back in 2016 when it embraced a uh, vision uh, in, a, in its blueprint for accountability. That part of the accountability we bring to city government is not just uh, holding others accountable, but it's really holding ourselves accountable as well. We know that we need to have uh, goals, we need to have indicators that we can hold ourselves ac to account to, and that we can have a way to gauge whether or not we're making progress towards those goals. That's not an easy task, particularly as when you all know, we do not staff ourselves in a way that has any administrative performance, financial budget unit that would normally do this for a department. <clears throat> so for us, it's been a struggle over the years to do that. And I think that is not a headline. I think what we have tried to do over the years is to address it as much as we can. This report gives us real clarity and real insights, and I think some very helpful ideas about the way we can and need to just start implementing that. Your discussion about the annual report is a perfect example of that. So I, I just wanted to convey on behalf of, from the staff, having looked at the, the report and worked with the auditors, we very much appreciate the time that they invested in doing this work. And we very much appreciate and agree with the recommendations uh, that they've provided to us. And we do look forward to implementing those as uh, we identified in, in my response. Um, what I thought I might do very briefly is to share two slides uh, that go through and walk through at a high level the recommendations. I'll ask Jeff Pierce to join me as well. Uh, and then come back and if we can answer any questions that you have about the report, uh, address any further questions about what building blocks we have in place uh, already that are starting to address some of those issues. 
uh, that's I, how I will uh, just proceed to to get the item back in your hands for discussion. If you'll bear with us on these two slides for just a moment, let me uh, call those up and share my screen. Oh, one moment. Well. Uh, I am not sure if this is something that you are able to see. Uh, is, am, I, am I correct that there is no, no PowerPoint showing in front of you or no BLA yeah. audit report recommendations? No. No, okay. Well, if I could ask you then in that case to simply turn or, or if I just draw your attention, um, it's on page 69 of the report if you have it nearby. If not, um, it, we'll just walk through them very briefly uh, for you. Uh, the, the slide that I would present and, and we will send to you and post online is simply a list of the report items uh, that the BLA uh, has recommended. You, their specific language, uh, their ordering, as well as the, the prioritization that they applied to it. Some of them they have asked uh, recommended be completed by the end of this fiscal year in uh, December, excuse me, at the end of this calendar year in uh, December, by December 30th. Others note uh, their recommendations, some of them, and the bulk of them, be completed uh, by the end of uh, June, the end of this fiscal year. And then uh, I think there's one that they recommend be completed by December of 2021. Okay. So just briefly, um, the I'm going to start with recommendation four. Uh, we spoke about this and you'll hear about this in the next issue uh, uh, on the agenda, but the first was to ensure adequate staffing at the commission. Uh, they spent a lot of time looking at the history of the commission's uh, vacancies and hiring needs and their recommendation to the board of supervisors and the board and the mayor's budget office was to expedite approval of requests to fill vacant positions at the commission and uh, allocate uh, the commission's um, uh, salary savings and funding to the work of the uh, commission to help the, to the work of the Department of Human Resources to help the commission with its recruitment and hiring in an expedited manner. <clears throat> we point out and I pointed out in my response letter to the BLA, we very strongly support this recommendation. Uh, that is something that we'll also touch on in the budget item that we refer to uh, on the agenda today. Um, and that really is one of the great dependencies uh, you'll see with the recommendations that are made uh, to help us complete these recommendations on the time frame envisioned by the BLA report. Uh, it will largely depend on our ability to have those seats filled. Uh, there are two other items. Uh, the first and second recommendations of the report speak to sort of the, well, number one, to the item we were just discussing, producing an annual report. And that is something where they are specifically uh, focusing on, again, outcomes. Uh, what are the outcomes? What are the specific performance measures that we want to um, identify for each functional area, not just one or two, and to, not, uh, and to have them consistent from year to year. Uh, so the report identifies some of the efforts we've made over time to capture uh, in our budget requests and at that time of the year, what we have been attempting to do, how far we've come. This report, basically says we need to standardize and make that consistent and, and have that broadened across area from year to year. That will really help the public understand, as you all have just been discussing, the impact of our work, how well we're doing, where areas of challenge might continue to exist. The, a, a third area is um, at, at recommendation number two, uh, is to formalize and document uh, training on ethics laws to city officials and employees. Not just what kind of training do we have to do and did we do it, but what are the training needs? How do we assess areas of risk to know where training is most needed? Um, what is the process that we have to track uh, and, and achieve those training goals with, uh, with the work that we're doing? And how do we evaluate routinely and then update and revise that training? This is a very significant area for us. I think this also speaks to some of the discussion items in the last uh, item on our agenda, uh, where we, we have work to do in the training arena we need to devote resources to enable us to do that. Uh, so this, this is a, there was some uh, uh, information in this report uh, briefly that spoke to the goal of doing that and the need to do that. The next set of items is, uh, there are five items in the report, recommendations three through eight, and they spoke to our audit program. 
Uh, this is an area where we have um, continued to struggle over the years, primarily because we have not had the staffing positions filled. And most importantly, we have not had a supervisory position filled for that group. So in essence, that supervisory work falls to other people, falls to the executive director to review audit reports. That is really the role of an audit supervisor and audit manager. And that's the position that we um, have uh, requested. We'll also touch on that in the budget item next. But for the work that we need to do and that the BLA audit provides us some, some further insights into, um, their uh, recommendations are that we produce a summary of audit findings after each audit cycle to our engagement and compliance team so that the kinds of issues that we see candidates and others uh, encountering during the election can be brought forward and helped incorporated into the kind of materials and training that we provide to candidates every year uh, so that we have the ability to learn from uh, that audit process to help people at the front end and, and help reduce findings of missing documentation and that sort of thing. Uh, this is something that we have in the works now uh, that we are collecting information from the 2018 audits that are winding their way down this month. Uh, so we're going to provide that to uh, the, the front, the engagement and compliance team to support that continuous information loop uh, and that make, it can make an impact in the, at the front end. Um, secondly, then uh, recommendation five speaks to establishing overall, overall goals for completing audits and then reporting on those results. Uh, also, uh, recommendation seven speaks to developing an updated audit manual that auditors uh, have, again, a consistent step-by-step -step guide as a way to go about their work. Uh, we have achieved significant improvements, in my view, in, in increasing the consistency of our audits across audits during audit cycles. But this is something that we don't have extensive documentation for. And we know that if in a period where uh, where there is any kind of staff turnover, which we hope we do not see, um, there is a need to have that knowledge sharing from person to person so that there is a consistent basis both to onboard and to help sustain the work that, that the, is reflective of the collective knowledge we have. So that is another recommendation they made. And then finally, as to the campaign or the, the audit program, um, uh, specifically uh, their tools, is, cre is establishing a formal training program for the audit division. Something again that includes uh, what are the needs that the audit division has to conduct its, its work? Uh, what are the training goals for each employee? Uh, and what's the process for tracking and then revising and monitoring to make sure that that's been impactful in, in supporting our audit? Uh, the last area they address is actually recommendation number six, and I'll backtrack just on that. They uh, obviously recommend that we approve procedures for a lobbying audit program and conduct a, an initial lobbying audit by the end of FY21. The audit staff has uh, provided a, a, a to me, a, a template, an initial draft uh, this spring to enable us to do that. And we had it on track for our staff to, to do an initial audit by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, given the demands operationally, given it with, the, uh, with the need to change to remote uh, work uh, and other COVID-19 related operational demands, that unfortunately has sat with me. And so this is something that I have to dust off and make sure that we are able to put into operation and complete this. And I'm very hopeful and expecting that we will do that. And um, I myself am committed to do that as well. I'm gonna pause there. Uh, the number of other recommendations, and I'd ask Jeff Pierce to, to join in. Um, this is recommendations nine through 16 speak to our investigative work. And if I could ask Jeff to, uh, to walk through briefly those items and then turn it back to any questions that you might have um, for us, uh, commissioners, that we can try and answer. Sure, thank you, Director Pelham, and uh, good morning, commissioners. So as, as Director Pelham noted, uh, fully half of the recommendations from the BLA audit regard uh, the processes and outcomes of the enforcement division. Uh, five of those eight recommendations concern investigations and enforcement generally. Uh, and then three of those eight regard the whistleblower protection uh, program specifically. Um, just a further note about, about background ground, as Director Pelham stated, that auditors certainly spent a lot of time with our staff and our, our staff spent a lot of time with auditors. Uh, we provided a lot of documentation for those auditors uh, and um, engaged in uh, a lot of back and forth uh, to clarify the, the nature of our work uh, and the, the mandates that affect us. Um, I would add that the auditors also consulted with peer jurisdictions so that they could develop an understanding of 
uh, how this division performs in implementing its mandate as compared to uh, enforcement divisions similar to ours, uh, including at the FPBC, uh, at the Los Angeles City Ethics Commission uh, in San Diego, uh, and also at the Oakland Public Ethics Commission. Um, so you will have seen in the report some uh, remarks about processes or outcomes from those peer jurisdictions. Um, and then finally, auditors also consulted internally within the city for similar purposes. They talked, for example, with uh, the deputy city attorney who consults the enforcement division and they spoke as well with uh, the Department of Human Resources Equal Employment Opportunity Division uh, for an analysis about how that division handles the particular retaliation jurisdiction uh, that they oversee. Um, so with, the, with that for background, I would just add to that please interrupt at any point if any of you has a question about these particular recommendations or about how staff has reflected on them. So the, the first recommendation affecting the enforcement division, uh, recommendation nine, you know, auditors were expressing uh, a caution here that the division not open in a given time period, more cases than it can resolve within that same time period uh, to avoid a piling up of matters that can grow old and stale. They've asked that we develop a, a plan to ensure that that happens and also to develop a method for reporting progress in, in that area. I would note that the, the plan uh, could include either that the division open fewer matters or that the division um, develop processes that would accelerate the resolution of existing matters. Uh, and I would say, I think that the division has endeavored to do both of those things already. I would, I would remind the commission about the discretionary factors that we adopted in the fall and that we began to implement at that time. Um, and of course, the, um, the ambition of the division to expand the fixed penalty policy and adopt a broader streamlined administrative resolution program that would accomplish the acceleration of certain kinds of matters before the commission. Um, it's, it's also true that as we reported in the July enforcement report in the last fiscal year, we <clears> opened <throat> 20 new investigations but resolved 48 investigations. So the, the division is moving in the direction that the auditors have identified uh, and we fully agree um, that it is not in the interest of the city it's not in the interest of the, the public for, for matters to age uh, unhelpfully. Um, and so we look forward to uh, developing that plan and, and to finding the most fruitful way of reporting on it to you. The 10th recommendation regards uh, a, a additional tracking that we might, might undertake. So what uh, I think what the auditors are concerned about here is if, if you look at Exhibits 18 and 19, the auditors endeavored to describe as fully as they could the enforcement process, which uh, is rather complex. You, you will see there that there are many decision points. There are many uh, opportunities for review, uh, some opportunities for uh, ratification or, or approval. Um, and so I think what the auditors hope is that uh, by developing these new metrics, the executive director and I can identify any inefficiencies in that process, and in particular, that we might t uh, take better track of um, any any points where it is the management's review that is imposing any inefficiencies on this process. So we have developed a kind of draft approach to tracking those new metrics, and uh, at this point, we have to figure out technologically what's the the best way to to implement that. Um, the eleventh recommendation really is that uh, that we bring to you uh, our goal with respect to the fixed penalty policy that we've been talking about for, for quite some time. Um, beyond that, when we do, the auditors have recommended that we present specifically an analysis about what the projected impact of that expanded program might be. And I think what they're identifying there is a concern that Commissioner Bush raised at the July meeting, uh, namely, how streamlined is streamlined? What can what can we really anticipate the impact of this this program might be? So we we will look forward to doing that. The executive director and I, uh, in the coming weeks and months, 
should have renewed opportunities to review those recommendations uh, and and bring them in a format that will be ready for public review and commission review. Um, let's see, the 12th recommendation regards the discretionary factors that we adopted in the fall. Here, I think the auditors uh, are looking for assurances both as to process and as to outcomes. So as to process, um, the auditors uh, note not, not that there is evidence uh, that the commission has applied these factors improperly uh, and not that there have been complaints that the commission has applied these factors improperly, but only that there is a risk given the, um, <coughs> the degree of discretion uh, provided in these factors that I, either the staff or the commission as a whole will apply their discretion uh, in uneven ways or that the public will worry that the that staff or the commission have have applied their discretion in uneven ways, and so we we will be happy to evaluate the the risk uh, that that we face there and to identify ways of mitigating that risk. As to outcomes, um, what the auditors have recommended is that we produce for the commission and uh, I suppose for the public. Uh, more data about how we have distinguished between which cases to pursue and which cases to put aside so that there is uh, a public accounting of in a in a comprehensive way of of how we have actually applied these factors um, both individually and as a whole uh, the next recommendation 13 regards training and I would note that it overlaps some with 16, which is training specifically in the whistleblower context. Um, it's true that in the last few years, I would say that on, on the whole, investigators have, um, they have in one sense learned on the job uh, more than they have been provided, say, uh, a structured process of onboarding or maybe an ongoing um, uh, system of, of mentoring. Um, I've recently had a conversation with Linda Simon, the head of DHR's Equal Employment Opportunity Division. Certainly that division has a larger staff, but they have also a very robust training program that includes a long period of onboarding uh, and, and conscientious mentoring of new hires. Uh, our investigators had already identified a desire for that internally before the, the auditors uh, engaged with us in this process. So if we had been successful in hiring the 1822 investigator, we had envisioned a more systematic process of onboarding, but the recommendation exceeds onboarding and goes to ongoing professional development. Um, I would note uh, one dependency there would be um, a reduced training budget that um, Stephen Massey will discuss with you in the subsequent agenda item. Um, but we acknowledge that we, we certainly want to develop the skills uh, and expertise of our team over time. Uh, we have sought ways to do that and we will continue to do so. In the last couple of weeks, we've had already conversations with the FPPC, the Los Angeles City Ethics Commission, uh, with uh, EEO, uh, with Linda Simon at EEO, as I mentioned, and also with the National Association of Attorneys General uh, and, a, and the training arm of the Federal Department of Justice to identify training opportunities for the team. Okay, so turning, unless there are questions on those five, I'll turn to the whistleblower protection context. Um, the, uh, the 14th recommendation regards reporting. Um, and this is uh, what Derek Kerr mentioned in his public comment uh, not so many minutes ago. So we will be, we will be glad to include uh, more detailed information about that in a public and an annual way. I think the public may not know that commissioners receive already ongoing reports about the individual case outcomes. Uh, under the commission's enforcement regulations, staff are required to provide at the very least summaries, if not full reports to commissioners about any matter that staff have elected to dismiss uh, or to close. And so commissioners have had some information available to them already about the specific nature of all of the matters that we have not pursued, including the whistleblower matters. Um, but we will look 
for ways of making some of that information um, more publicly available uh, within the confines of the charter's confidentiality requirement. Uh, the 15th recommendation regards timelines. Uh, and the auditor's concern here is that long timeframes for resolving whistleblower protection investigations don't adequately vindicate the city's policy commitment to protecting whistleblowers. And, and we are certainly sympathetic to that you know, with, the, with the caveat that as Thomas McLean described in the fall or the winter, uh, whistleblower protection investigations are enormously fact intensive and require many, many more uh, witness interviews than, than most of our other investigations do. Um, but as a matter of policy, we certainly agree that uh, shorter timeframes would better vindicate the city's commitment to protecting whistleblowers here. Um, we will look forward to evaluating how we might uh, prioritize whistleblower matters vis-a-vis -vis the, the other areas of jurisdiction that we retain, and we uh, will gladly report back to you uh, in the future on that. And then again, the last recommendation uh, I mentioned in relation to recommendation 13, that regards specialized training for uh, the whistleblower context. The auditors note that whistleblower protection law is much more akin to labor law than it is to government ethics. Um, we did a couple of years ago invite counterparts from the state labor commissioner's office to join us in San Francisco. Um, we had a we had a training both in the substantive law and in methods of investigation. At that time, we invited members from other city departments to join us there, and we had an audience uh, or a group of participants. I don't remember fifty or seventy five strong. Uh, we have not since uh, refreshed uh, trainings in that area, but we agree that this is uh, a specialty uh, that was a lower protection is. A unique area of law. I think when we attend the annual Council on Governmental Ethics Laws conference, what we find is that uh, the, we have no pure jurisdictions, either in California or across the country, who retain the same jurisdiction that we do. So uh, it is it is generally outside the scope of those conversations, and so we have to look elsewhere uh, for substantive training and um, procedural training. We have spoken recently with Deputy City Attorney Jenica Maldonado. She has a background in labor law. We'll be working more closely with her to improve our capacity in the whistleblower protection area. Uh, and as I mentioned, I've spoken also with the head of the city's EEO division. And Linda Simon has pledged her support in helping develop the capacity of our investigators uh, both to um, uh, broaden our view of the substantive law and to improve the methods of investigation that we undertake in that aspect of our jurisdiction. Um, commissioners, I'm going to give you all the first opportunity to raise your hand um, if you want to um, make comments or ask questions, and then I'll go last. Um, so. Commissioner Chu, your hand has been up for a while, so I don't know if you're raising it again or. Uh, no, I, I I can't tell whether it's been up, but uh, yes, my hand uh, hand was up, and I, I'd like to start with just a a process question. Um, first off, I want to thank uh, Director Pelham and staff for doing all the underlying additional work in order to be able to provide the information and data and reporting needed for the. Uh, BLA to be able to complete its audit. I think that this is a very comprehensive and uh, detailed report and recommendations and would would like to start broadly, you know, by understanding that, you know, what is the process and the timing and what is the impact that the that this report will have on our budget going forward? Because I, I know that there are 16 uh, very detailed recommendations uh, you know, 31% of which are level one, which they recommend should be completed by the end of the calendar year, and an additional 56%, so nine out of the 16, that should be completed by June of next year. And then uh, two more, so 13% that need to be completed by uh, December 31st of 2021. So there's uh, a lot of work to be done, and it is significant work. And uh, really important work, uh, but I think as we've discussed uh, over time, and you know, we'll certainly get into in the budget presentation. 
and, and is identified in and of itself in, in, in this uh, audit report and recommendations is that, that there is uh, a chronic understaffing in, in the Ethics Commission as well as ongoing challenges to be able to fill those positions. So, uh, and if we just take the very first number one priority, um, formalize and document procedures to provide training on ethics laws to city employees and officials. And, you know, that was the ethics at work initiative that we had identified, but in the absence of funding from the, from the, through the budget process uh, and the ability to be able to fill these positions on a faster than 168 uh, timeline, uh, I, I'm at a loss as to how we can, how we can implement these. So my long winded wind up to this is, you know, how will this uh, report and uh, budget recommendations help us, if at all, uh, to be able to attain the budget and the resourcing uh, that we will need in order to be able to take action on these recommendations. If if I might uh, respond, uh, Commissioner Chu, it, it's I think those are all very fair points. I think our ability to accomplish what we envision will absolutely be impacted by the uh, availability of resources to do that work and when those resources become available to us. Uh, we know, you know, expedited hiring means we could have authority to fill positions, you know, sooner than we're actually able to have seats in the job. In the job, then we have onboarding and training when people are in those roles to give them the knowledge and the skills and the, the tools to accomplish that work. That takes time. Um, I think it's fair to say at the same time that this BLA audit report gives us a further path for the kind of work that we need to do when we are able to get those resources. So yes, on the one hand, I, I, I think the sequencing and the timetables that are provided as recommendations in the BLA report may not be achievable depending on the budget resources that we have and when we're able to actually have bodies in seats. But that said, the work that we need to do, I think will be very helpfully shaped by the insights and the recommendations that this report contains so that we do do that type of work as we can move forward. Yeah, so, and maybe this is a more practical question and perhaps Commissioner Bush, uh, given his experience has a little more insight into this, but you know, how impactful will this uh, BLA audit and report and recommendations be on the Board of Supervisors in terms of their consideration of our budget? If, if there is the request from the commission saying that, you know, we want to do an ethics at work program in order to address the, the you know, significant training needs given the, the significant allegations against, uh, you know, multiple members of uh, city departments. And now the um, BLA itself has conducted a thorough review and is making recommendations that, you know, training needs to be done. You know, it, will this have an impact? I mean, will, will that help us get, get the funds? I mean, and I, I know that I'm not, don't mean to put you on the spot, Commissioner Bush, in terms of, of uh, you know, committing or in, in any way, but I just am trying to understand, like, it, you know, can this, you know, materially and, and uh, um, in a very real sense, help us uh, get the, the budget dollars that we're going to, to need uh, to be able to make a significant headway against the work. And I appreciate, Director Pelham, that, that of course we are going to continue to do this work, but, you know, being understaffed and under-resourced under necessarily curtails the impact and progress that we can make. Uh, you were lucky for a minute there. <laughs> so uh, let me say that I think that the impact of the report is to put these issues on the agenda, but not to solve the question of how to fund them. I think that there are some things that were not included in either the report or the response that point us in a direction to... Uh, <coughs> Uh, to better handle some of the issues that were raised. For example, the backlog in complaints and how fast they're resolved. There's really not a good guide for people filing a complaint to let them know that there are other places where complaints are referred. So for example, in past elections, we've seen people put up political posts in buses uh, and on public transportation. But those don't get really, as I understand it, Mr. Pierce will know the answer to that. Those don't get handled by ethics. They get referred over to MTA. 
because there's a specific provision in the MTA thing about polit political posting on public transportation. Same thing about uh, advertisements that include a, uh, a uniformed officer, either police or fire, in an ad. They get referred to those departments and not to ethics. So to the extent that you can let people who are filing complaints know that we will be referring this on to other departments, you can reduce some of the incoming uh, level of complaints. And that's going to be particularly important going into November because there are going to be so many campaigns and so many uh, questions raised. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing that I didn't see uh, addressed is what other training resources funds are available. And I, I, I mentioned to uh, Executive Director Pelham that I had come across a DHR, uh, the information on implicit bias training. And it turns out that there is a requirement for many city employees to take that training and that there was an MOU with the MEA that provides for city funding to reimburse the fees for that training. And in the same way, there's a training by them on sex harassment. And it raised the question in my mind as to whether or not there shouldn't be similar training on Form 700s. Why, why wouldn't that be similar to any of the other kinds of training that employees have to undergo? And if so, is there a sufficient funding in those departments to provide that training or at least to provide some funding to ethics so that we provide it under a contract to them? Um, I think that's something worth exploring. And the third thing is on Form 700s, which is a big ticket item in terms of, of reviewing it. I believe that there's a basis for cost sharing from the departments that are transferring paper filings to electronic filings with oversight by ethics. Uh, I think that the uh, director Pelham identified something like 3,600 paper filings that have to go into electronic filing. I did a, a quick back the envelope check with city departments and three departments alone account for a thousand of those. Um, and they are uh, departments that have uh, their own revenue. They're not coming from the general fund, but it's the airport, for example, or uh, PUC, and where they have other funding that's not gonna come out of the general fund. And, uh, and having talked to a little bit with uh, Ed Harrington, who was once head of the PUC and once the controller, he said it's not unusual at all uh, for there to be a cost sharing arrangement between departments and those agencies. He mentioned the airport, public health, and PUC. Um, I hope I haven't just put him on straight onto the curb by telling the story about that. But it seems to me that those are three levels to go back to Commissioner Chu's question about resources to do it. And does this, uh, does this report provide guidance on that? It does not, but it does provide an agenda and a priority, and it gives the door opening for us to explore some of these other options, whether that's funding that's already allocated for DHR for their training purposes, whether it's funding from uh, departments that have now paying for the paper filing, but no longer will have to pay for a staffer to do that. We'll no longer have to pay for a file setup, but we'll transfer all of that to our costs. I don't see why we shouldn't have some costs that go with the transfer of the duties. Um, and then thirdly, uh, slimming down the kind of complaints that get filed with ethics. Like if it's gonna go on to MTA or if it's gonna go on to the police or somewhere else where we have enough experience with those complaints coming in to know this is gonna be the pattern. You can certainly put up a, a, a guide to people wanting to uh, hold government accountable for its actions about where to take those questions. So it's not a complete answer, but it moves us forward and what it does if we do that is tell the Board of Supervisors, 
yes, we will be part of this, the solution. We're not just throwing up our hands and saying well, it can't be done, but we, we can be part of the solution. And here are some of the ways we can go about it. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to just interrupt just for a second because I see that Commissioner Smith um, has dropped off my screen. I'm just wondering if maybe she is in the panelist queue waiting for the monitor to invite her back in. Um, so can you just check there to see? Uh, yes, Chair Ambrose. I did check. We've been checking periodically. Uh, Jared is behind the scenes and he's trying to, uh, I think he did shoot a message saying that uh, they're attempting to restart. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure that we um, aren't just leaving her standing by. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'm going to go, I can go back to Commissioner Chu if you had thrown, no, you're good. Okay. I am, um, then I'm going to invite Commissioner Lee to please um, provide comments and questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, going back to the um, whistleblower uh, recommendation, I'm glad to hear staff is reaching out to other um, city agencies for, and other uh, colleagues around the state um, for training, because it is true, labor and employment law is a very unique uh, um, um, field. But I would recommend that the staff, in, in addition to working with uh, the city family, to reach out to the private sector, because the whistleblower program, whistleblower, whistleblower um, uh, investigation protection is so um, complex and unique that it would be a good um, way for the staff to get both perspectives from both the uh, both sides so that when you work with uh, potential um, um, uh, complainants that you would uh, be well versed, so to speak, in both sides of the the law. So I don't know if the budget would allow you to do that, but I think there are a lot of pro bono programs put up by uh, ABA and and other folks. Uh, but I would certainly recommend that you seek out the private sector uh, training as well. Okay, um, if it's okay, then I just had a quick um, couple of comments. I uh, one uh, Commissioner Chu, you had asked about the the process, um, and I just wanted to be um, have the director explain uh, the BLA report was issued, but typically my understanding is is that there'll be a public hearing at government audit once the board has an opportunity to calendar that, and that'll be a, then a, a chance for the department to um, both answer questions from the board and also speak to what we're gonna do um, in light of the recommendations. So I don't know if you have any information about when that might be calendar, but I'm assuming it will be within the next six weeks or so. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I do not at this moment have an idea of when they're going to schedule it. Uh, that is the process that you described. We expect that the committee would have a hearing on it uh, and that would be an opportunity to go provide any further uh, comment on it. Uh, uh, I do know that the board is you know, uh, deep in the midst of some of the uh, budget hearings right now. So uh, as soon as we know something more about the time frame, we will certainly let you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then my um, comments I can follow up with staff directly. I, I do think that in the face of um, the city's budget crunch, the fact that um, it seems that some of the represented groups in the city are conceding that they have to forego um, salary, negotiated salary increases in light of the $1.7 billion um, budget shortfall that, that we shouldn't hold out a lot of hope that we're gonna get an increase in our budget this year. I think that the staff has been working really hard to hold on to what we have 
already, but I, I also think that, um, you know, what uh, staff has been ex explaining about working with other departments in the city and reaching out to people, taking advantage of whatever existing resources there are with respect to training, what Commissioner Bess was talking about in terms of trying to uh, seek um, funding from departments that are not as vulnerable to general fund uh, revenue losses uh, is also important. One of the things that I noted when I was waiting for the budget hearing uh, to start at the uh, board on Wednesday for the Ethics Commission, I listened to the controller's um, budget presentation and uh, he was very clear about how successful the controller's office had been in moving their uh, budget needs from the general fund to other departments, so th through work orders. So obviously, I mean, the controllers may be a resource for us. They can help us explain um, or understand how uh, he managed to get the enterprise departments to fund functions of the controller because that's exactly what um, I think uh, the commissioners are, are saying we need to, to look at. I mean, we're a wholly general fund funded department and if there are functions that we're performing that are to the advantage of departments that have other sources of funds, we need to try and <clears throat> see if they'll share some of that with us. And then lastly, on the whistleblower issue, I am, I'm really concerned about um, the fact that we've seen from the controller's report on the Public Works Department um, that both the controller and the city attorney's office has something like a five-fold increase in whistleblower calls in the face of the FBI's investigation and, and corruption investigations. And that um, means that there's a lot of people out there in the in the city workforce who are um, putting themselves forward and potentially at risk for uh, retaliation. And I want to make sure that when you're looking at how you're allocating your staff resources going forward and you're reaching out to the other departments, I realize they're all very preliminary. They haven't come to the department yet, there haven't been time, presumably, even for people to be retaliated against yet, but um, with that kind of, of groundswell of engagement with the whistleblower program, we need to be prepared for that. So I just want to, you know, just put that bug in your ear. At some point later, I'll ask you how that's showing up on your um, inbox, okay? Um, and then lastly, it did, uh, one of the things that they did say is that we should have that public, the fixed penalty policy back in January of 2021. There's a few other dates in there. And just from a pure uh, procedural point of view, I want to try and keep, start putting together a sort of forward agenda so that um, we can have, you know, sort of meaningful and measured commission meetings on a monthly basis. So um, as you go through the BLA report and make conscious yeah. decisions about after you know how much staff you're going to have about what uh, deadlines you can meet and which ones you can per <clears throat> commissioner, choose note that there's a good number of them that they want to see done by December and so forth. Um, if you can bring that back to us as part of your executive director's report, like where you think you are relative to their recommended deadlines, I think that would be helpful for us all to keep in our mind what um, what uh, everybody else thinks we should be doing. So thank you for that. If, if I, I may chair, just a couple of brief responses to uh, on the some of the, the comments of commissioners and the questions. Um, in our next item on the agenda in the budget, we will walk through very in a detailed way what information we did use from the BLA report in our budget presentation on Wednesday. So the the analysis and the report was made issue was it made public on Monday, but we we did want to highlight that information in our budget budget <laughs> presentation uh, on Wednesday to the Appropriations Committee. So we'll talk about that in, in Agenda Item Seven a bit more. Uh, on on as to sort of how we might look to new funding models to give us uh, a better chance at having sustained funding 
that can accomplish this work. One of the things that has also been a challenge historically is not having had a finance admin budget person to help create those opportunities and sustain those opportunities because it won't happen in isolation. We need to work it, right? So one of the things that operationally we did, just as a point of information, is uh, with our, our our structure this year, as I reported last month, we we have, um, when uh, our deputy director, Guy Three Tykendeel, is back from leave, uh, she's assumed the role as chief operating officer because we know we need to designate some more capacity internally, even within an existing um, funding levels and staffing levels to really focus on enabling those conversations and ideas and uh, to be pursued in, in real time. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as a reminder that we, we know that that's going to take some resources and we've shifted things around even internally now to make that conversation and that issue much more at the top of our agenda so that we can really pursue some innovative funding models that other departments seem to do quite well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And if uh, excuse me, if my, uh, excuse me, Chair, I do want to inform you all that unfortunately, Commissioner Smith has uh, experienced a power outage in her area, but she is on the phone line and she will be remained unmuted throughout the process on the phone line. All right, thank you for that. Appreciate um, her diligence to stay um, online. So I see your hand coming, Commissioner Lee, and then Commissioner Chu. So, Commissioner Lee, did you want to? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make one more comment now that you mentioned the whistleblower program. Just one more comment. I think that San Francisco is really unique compared to other uh, Bay Area counties and, and uh, state um, ethnic commission offices because our uh, workforce is more diverse in terms of um, people from communities of colors and also first generation San Franciscans. So the traditional knowledge of what a whistleblower program is, is relatively new. Uh, it represents certain uncertainties for these populations. So I would really um, encourage the staff uh, to really take that in mind when you're going through uh, the training, the education and the outreach when you design not design, but when you uh, conduct um, uh, outreach and investigations, because those are the key areas that uh, we've seen uh, that uh, might have impeded um, workers from ste uh, stepping forward. Thank you for that comment. Commissioner uh, Chu, you had Yes, I just wanted to make one final comment, and, and I, I do appreciate that there is a significant budget shortfall of $1.7 billion uh, for the city budget due to the ongoing global pandemic. But I also want to point out that, that you know, we are continuing to learn about the unprecedented corruption, uh, not just the actions that have been alleged to have been taken by city officials, but also the culture that enabled it. And that in this time of crisis, this is the opportunity for the Board of Supervisors and the city to, as well as the mayor, to show the residents and the citizens of San Francisco what is important. Because when things are going great and we have a lot of resources, lots of things can be done. But it's when resources are constrained and the times are tough that it becomes the true measure of what a city and the people I think are important. And I think that the residents and the, and the citizens of San Francisco deserve better than what they've been getting in terms of the public contracting and the you know, significant allegations uh, against uh, city officials and the violation of that public trust. And that this BLA report lays out a very clear roadmap and priorities for what the Ethics Commission uh, can do to address those shortcomings. And I think that it would be a big missed opportunity and really unforgivable if the city does, does not do more to address uh, and fund the solutions that 
are not just being recommended by the Ethics Commission, but have been, been uh, are being recommended by the uh, BLA audit and report. And that this is an opportunity for the Board of Supervisors, you know, and the mayor uh, to say, Corruption will not stand in San Francisco. Like the allegations that have come to light are not acceptable and that we are going to create a different kind of culture. And we are going to create programs and training so that people know what to do and know that this kind of behavior is, is wrong. And if we don't do that, I think that we all lose. And I think it sends the message that it's okay. And because we have this other, you know, not insignificant global pandemic that's going on, but we, we do have money. It's not that we don't have money. We do have money in the budget. We just have less of it. And so what are those, what are those priorities that are really important and that you have to invest in uh, in order to build public trust that this, that this city takes clean government and accountable government and transparent government seriously? And, and the way that you do that is by putting resources into it. It's not enough to have lip service and to say that, oh, you know, this is not okay, this is not okay, but, you know, we're not going to fund training. So uh, I feel pretty strongly about this um, and, and just wanted to, to note that for the record. Thank you. Yeah, I hear you and certainly appreciate it. And I, I do think that um, Executive Director Pelham did a good job at the, I don't know who else had a chance to watch that, but we can talk about that a little bit more on the next agenda item. We're waiting for, oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna call for public comment, but first I'll call for Commissioner Bush to um, have his hand recognized. Am I unmuted now? Yes. I wanna associate myself with uh, Commissioner Chu's remarks. I can't help but think of the image of being unable to pay for the burglar alarm while the burglar is down there rifling through the family silver and taking it out of your drawers. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on. We are, you're making a choice. And the choice is we're okay at being open to being robbed constantly. And the people who are being robbed are the taxpayers of the city because we're overpaying on rigged contracts. And we have a policies that have chosen to ignore that. I, I just as a one anecdote of it, we had, uh, a fellow who was a city contractor for a number of contracts who was indicted by the federal government for bid rigging. And while he was under indictment, he was awarded a new contract by a city agency. And when I called to say, why are you giving this guy a contract when he's just been given a criminal indictment? They said, well, he hasn't been convicted. He's only been indicted. Well, I think that, uh, City Attorney Herrera's new policy closes that door a little bit, but it's after the fact. If you take a look at something like Mohammed Nauru and his Form 700 filing, he did not mention on his Form 700 filing that he was chair of the uh, transportation agency that oversees uh, that new facility. And that's where he was wheeling and dealing and getting payoffs to give contracts wasn't even on his Form 700. Why wasn't it on his Form 700? Who knows? But why wasn't it checked? Because we don't have the money to do audits of the Form 700s. So you have to, you know, you pay your money and you take your choice. And in our case, we're not paying the money and the choice is to let them get away with it. I'm finished my little rant. No, I, I think we all share your fervor on these issues. Um, I just also think that we need to reach out wherever we can um, to get the resources because exactly what you're saying, what what we need to do is important. And, and one way or the other, we need to see what we can do to get it done. Um, I am gonna, uh, unless, I don't know, can I ask if Commissioner Smith has any comment um, by phone? Thanks. Thank you, Chair, uh, Madam Chair. No, I don't have it. I've been listening intently, but I don't have any comments. I certainly agree with the concerns expressed by both Commissioner Bush and Commissioner Chu. Thank you. Thank you. And then now, moderator, can we see if we have public comment on this item? Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. 
For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have joined this meeting, we are currently on public discussion on the motion of agenda item number six, discussion of budget and legislative analyst BLA performance audit report of the ethics commission conducted at the request of the board of supervisors. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. We are continuing to see if there's any callers. Madam Chair, there are no more, there are no callers in the queue. Oh, okay. I'm actually, if everyone is okay with it, I'd like to just take a five minute break before we pick up with agenda item seven, the budget. If that is suitable, uh, we'll be back online in five minutes. Is that okay? All right, thank you. Be right back. <laughs>
number seven. Agenda number seven is discussion of ethics commission annual budget as proposed by the mayor's office for fiscal year 2021, 21, 22. Somebody else needs to mute themselves. Is that commissioner, I'm sorry, executive director Pelham, are you ready to present along yes. with um, Mr. Massey? Thank yes. you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to just do a quick uh, recap of where we are procedurally for, for the Commission and, and uh, those listening to the meeting. Uh, Stephen Massey, who is our Acting Chief Operating Officer and also serves regularly as our Director of Technology Services, has been uh, stepping in in a major way to uh, lift with this budget process. Uh, so I, I just, as a recap, I, you know that we, uh, the Board of Supervisors this week began their uh, hearings, departmental hearings, on the mayor's proposed budget for FY21 and FY22. Uh, the mayor's budget overall presents a $3.7 billion city budget for the coming FY21. Um, and um, for our office, uh, there are, are some uh, changes from uh, what we had an, an, uh, anticipated from the 10% cut exercise that everybody was required to do in June. I'll leave those details to Stephen to, to, to cover with you. But we presented our uh, uh, information to the uh, committee, the board committee on um, Wednesday morning. Uh, you may re recall that the city right now is operating on essentially an interim budget uh, prior to the actual end of the fiscal year uh, 20. Uh, the, the, the city adopted an interim measure that would guide, uh, provide funding between now and October 1st when the new budget will be in place for FY21. So oddly, even though we are now in FY21, which starts July 1st and goes through June 30th, uh, the budget that is under discussion is what the budget for October 1st through June 30th will look like. And also in the city's normal course presents a budget for FY22 a year from now as well. You will also recall that even though we talk about an FY22 budget, uh, in this context, because that's the way the, the mayor's office and the city, uh, the, uh, the board adopts a budget. We still need to go to, as departments, most of us, back through the budget process that starts typically in February. So when we start, uh, uh, essentially we're in a year round budgeting process where we will now, once an October budget is put to rest and know with certainty what our resources are, Early uh, part of the year in February, we will come to you again with a, a proposed budget for FY22. It is in fact an annual budget process for us as a department, as it is for most city departments. Um, with that, I think I will pause here and ask Stephen Massey to join us uh, and share uh, information about what the mayor's proposed budget for the commission uh, looked like with her issuance of the a proposed city budget on July 31st, and then also uh, with the, the feedback of, and information that we provided at the uh, Budget and Appropriations Committee on Wednesday morning. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm going to start the slide presentation. Give me one moment. Are you all able to see the slides? Yes, I can. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, I wanna take about 10 to 15 minutes to review the, the slides that were presented to the board uh, to get you up to speed on where we stand at this point and then uh, with that knowledge, open it up for questions. So let's start with the second slide here. So as you know, uh, in February, prior to the shelter in place, the commission submitted a budget that requested an additional 1.8 million in annual and continuing spending. As the economic situation changed over the past few months, the city's fiscal outlook has changed considerably. So the commission was asked to submit a revised budget request with 10% cuts to the base budget in fiscal year 21 with a 5% contingency cut and a 15% cut to the base budget in fiscal year 22. After the commission complied with that request, the mayor's office revised the cut down from the initial 10% starting point. And the table on the slide here shows the, finals, uh, the final mayor's uh, proposed budget that was sent to the Board of Su Supervisors Budget and Appropriations Committee for consideration. So in fiscal year 21, 
the commission loses one-time funding in salaries and materials and supplies, which results in roughly a 3% cut from the operating budget that was available in fiscal year 20. But it's also roughly no change from the commission's base budget. It also adjusts the commission's attrition target, which requires a certain amount of salary savings each year. This target is increased in fiscal year 21 to salaries that are equivalent to 2.41 positions. So I'll talk about how we plan to achieve that in a minute. In fiscal year 22, the mayor is proposing to restore the 3% cut and increase funding roughly over 6%. However, the fiscal year 22 budget remains a target and is subject to the normal budget negotiations that happen each year starting in February. Um, now, the, sorry? Steve, uh, Chair Ambrose, may I ask a question about the salary savings? I'm sorry, you're, you're on mute. There we go. Uh, yes, please. I actually think given um, the uh, amount of material, if you get have clarifying questions as opposed to comments, let's all plan on asking them as the material is presented. So please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, Stephen, uh, th thank you. My, my question was on salary savings. Was that, are those salary savings in addition to what the commission is already saving in terms of salary because um, we don't hire? Um, uh, on, you know, we, we have such a, a protracted hiring process and we have those salary savings. And, and is the amount that's identified here going to be in addition to those current amounts? So if positions are left vacant due to delays in hiring, that would satisfy the uh, salary savings requirement. The, the problem comes in into planning long term. Uh, right. As the fiscal year goes along, you don't want to be caught in a situation where uh, you don't have the funds to pay filled positions. Uh, so that, that becomes the, the difficult thing to manage throughout the year. Right. And then because, because uh, positions are budgeted at 0.75 uh, salary for the first year, but you have a full run rate the following year, is that also going, is that also reflected in these numbers? That, that is normally how it works. In this year, it's slightly different due to the interim budget. So mm -hmm. any new positions will start as a 0.5 and they can't start until January. I see. Okay. Thank you. So uh, at, at the Board of Supervisors meeting on Wednesday, the controller also warns that the current bu uh, year budget will need to be actively managed if assumptions in the budget don't pan out. So uh, this could result in, in uh, cuts mid-year. So one of the issues that Director Pelham highlighted for the board is that even though the budget authorizes up to 24 employees, after attrition and ongoing difficulties with getting hiring assistance from the Department of Human Resources and ongoing disaster service work being conducted by commission employees, that capacity in certain commission divisions is considerably constrained. So in, in the audit division here, the 1824 audit supervisor position is currently vacant and has been vacant for about a year. The mayor has implemented a hiring freeze and in addition, one auditor is on extended disaster service work through December. So this leaves two of the four audit positions available. Those resources have been completely allocated to administering the public financing program and requires that further audits and program improvements, in addition to any new kinds of compliance reviews, be on hold until 2021. The proposed budget will green light the hiring of the 1824 audit supervisor position, but not until January 2021. So we have essentially funding for a 0.5 FTE, uh, and that leaves the position vacant for the first half of the fiscal year. And then over in the policy division, one of the two positions remains vacant. This will constrain our capacity to do uh, effective policy analysis and legislative development which is especially difficult during a time when the controller's office is issuing findings based on their investigation of the cor corruption scandal at the Public Works Department. The proposed budget will also green light hiring the 1822 policy analyst, but also not until January 2021. So that leaves the position vacant for the first half of the fiscal year, and we only have funding for a 0.5 FTE. Uh, Stephen, I have another yeah. clarifying question. So if, if Hiring is authorized effective as of January 2021. Does that mean that the commission cannot start the hiring process until January 2021? Or that we could begin the hiring process because it does take 160 days, we could begin it 
in the fall, but it can only make we can only make an offer or have an effective start date in January of 2021. Correct. So we can only make a, a an offer for a start date effective January 1. We okay. can probably start the process shortly after October 1st when the budget is approved. Um, okay. But the hiring process in the city, as is discussed in the, the um, audit report from the budget and legislative analysts, uh, it, it takes quite a long time to go through the hiring process in the city. Correct. But and a lot of this will also depend on whether the position is uh, filled as a, a um, sort of temporary hire or a civil service hire. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on to the enforcement division. So in the enforcement division, one 1822 investigator position remains vacant and another 1823 investigator is on extended disaster service work through December of 2020. So this leaves two investigators and the enforcement director remaining in the division. We foresee this impacting the timeliness of investigations and case resolutions, but also delay progress on updating and further strengthening enforcement policies and practices. If we feel, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm backtracking because I didn't get myself. So, so oh, I'm sorry. Stuff. I can't see your um, your hand and my, I moved them. I moved you all out of the way so I could read this chart. Please go ahead. Do you want me to go back, Commissioner Uh No, I, I want to ask a question about something sure. you just said, which was that the hiring process is uh, extended. So it takes a long time to get somebody on board. What would happen if you, instead of hiring people, did a contract to the FPPC for audits? Because they do have legal authority, which they didn't used to have, to undertake that for local governments using the local government's law about what's required. So if you instead had money for a one-time contract, could we get the audit thing going faster? I, I have not looked into that, so I can't I can't really answer that question now. And Commissioner then, Bush, if I might just jump in briefly, I, I would suspect that with the city's contracting processes that are quite complex as well, even uh, that, that would probably not take uh, a, a less amount of time. But we could certainly look into that to see what the time frames have been when other jurisdictions have done that. If, if you could look into it, it would be uh, give us more information to make a decision about uh, how to move this forward. Thank you. Okay, so uh, coming back to the enforcement division, if we fill the audit and policy positions that I discussed, then we will have a salary shortfall and so uh, for the investigator position, so it will need to remain vacant through June of 2022 to meet the attrition savings target. And then in the electronic disclosure and data analysis division, the division has three permanent positions and one limited project position, the 1042 information systems engineer. And that was funded by a project that was sponsored by the committee on information technology in fiscal year 20. The position was eliminated on July 1st. And at that time, the commission's budget office did not authorize continuing the position. In the most recent uh, proposal, the mayor's budget office proposes reinstating the information systems engineer position, but not until January 2021. So the impact of this is that there will be a six, six month gap without the information systems engineer position on staff. And while, while I'm discussing, oh, is there a question? Um, I. I'm not sure I'm not muted. I, I want to just make sure I understand this because this really ties into the whole form 700. Um, so you're, you have, you have four FTEs, you have funding for those FTEs going forward, or you are losing one um, going forward in, uh, if, if the board doesn't um, reauthorize. So we had four in last fiscal year, and the, one of those positions was limited to a one-year term. And in the original February budget submission, we had proposed continuing that one project-based position. Okay. When the hiring freeze went in place, 
the mayor's office no longer authorized uh, any, any position. New, they considered it to be a, a new position. Um, so they would not authorize it to continue. And the position, position was eliminated on uh, after June 30th um, at the end of the fiscal year. In this coming uh, budget, right now we have three FTEs um, and the mayor's office is proposing to bring that position back but only at a 0.5 FTE, so we could hire it effective January 1st, 2021. And so, and was there somebody in that job? So it was just, or it was just a position, and but you didn't have somebody on in that job on a temporary basis. And I thought you know, we we had, um, and I, I I can get into a lot more detail about this. The uh, we had a 1053. Uh, IS business analyst position that was recently vacated before the shelter in place. And we had an employee in the IS engineer position that was eliminated. Uh, he was able to apply for the IS business analyst position. So we were able to retain him, but now we're down one position. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a question, Stephen. Sure. Uh, with uh, the position 1042 being filled in January of 2021, does this mean that the uh, planned launch of the e-filing of the Form 700 is still on track, or would that also be delayed since that person would not be able to start until January? Yeah, so it would be delayed. And, and may, maybe it would help if I just gave kind of a, a background of the Form 700 and where we stand with that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that might might help give some context because it's been impacted throughout this budget process. Um, so uh, I just remind everyone, the, the commission uh, currently provides an online system uh, via net file for elected officials, board and commission members and department heads that file form 700 uh, with the ethics commission to file electronically. Uh, and the recent regulation that the commission approved would expand use of the system to roughly 35, 3,600 designated city employee filers that currently file on paper with their department filing officers. Uh, so prior to the shelter in place, that project was underway. So in addition to approving the regulation, staff had recently completed a lengthy meet and confer process with the collective bargaining units. Uh, and they are now on board with the electronic filing of the form 700 and we are also doing extensive outreach to, to departments. Uh, the engagement and compliance staff were also beginning the process to develop the training and the outreach material. Uh, staff had and still has sufficient uh, non-personnel funds from the Committee on Information Technology uh, to purchase all the necessary licenses and materials and supplies for the project. Uh, the, the, the project dependency problem that uh, needs to be discussed is almost entirely on the staff resources side. Um, so one, one of the outcomes of the meet and confer process and meetings with the departments was the feedback that the ethics commission needed a, a dedicated support for filers and the filing officers that will be administering the system uh, f for their department. Uh, the uh, customer service role would be the commission's frontline telephone and online support for the system. And in February, staff requested an 1840 e-filing customer service uh, a position for the project as a, a three-year limited term position from the Committee on Information Technology uh, through their budget process. And that request was denied. Uh, in, in addition, the project is going to require a technology lead to migrate the data from the city's HR system to the net file system to get employees set up with their filing accounts. Why isn't this being paid for by the departments? It's, it's their not a job. They are the ones who are supposed to be filing it. They've been filing it for years in paper. They've been paying a staffer to handle that. They've been paying for filing and storage. Now it's going to come to us, but none of the dollars that they've been spending are going to come to us. That's not right. Right. I agree. Thank you, Commissioner Bush. So, to give a little background on this, uh, the Committee on Information Technology originally was funding both the uh, position side of this and the non-personnel side of bringing up this project. And really the question of the ongoing way that we were going to fund this project, whether this was going to be funded through the Ethics Commission's budget 
or funded by other departments really was something that could be put off for about two years. Now we have a problem uh, do this budget season on the uh, staffing side. And uh, yes, that, that's not to say that that's not a, a, a possible solution, uh, but that's at least not where we stand at the moment with the budget negotiations. Even in this document that, you, that we're looking at now uh, of the budget uh, impacts, you're stating that we're not gonna have Form 700s filed until January of 2022. Correct. That's really uh, too long. I don't think that's at all acceptable. And I don't think that it's because of us. I think it's because the resources are not traveling with the job. I, I, I don't disagree with you, Commissioner Bush. That's but a very- Let me just question. ask if I can jump in here, because I want to make sure we're really clear about this. If you, um, even assuming that um, you could get work ordered money from the other department, what I thought I just heard you say is we don't have a body in a chair to create the net file accounts for the 3,500 people, putting aside the customer service e-filing contact person, which is one position that we don't have. You're also saying just logistically, you don't have somebody who can take all of the contacts for all of the 35 plus 100 people who are paper filing to create net file accounts for them so that they're ready to file in April. Is that, and if, if you had the money tomorrow, would you be able to move somebody into that position to do that um, that preliminary work? At, at this point, it would be very tight to pull off the project because we're already in August. Ideally, we would have had all of these accounts set up in the September to October timeframe. Uh, and uh, we're, we're fast approaching that. Um, and it, I, I don't see a path where we can bring on a person uh, in, in that, that kind of time frame. I just, because I think what all the commissioners are saying are, and what, what we're certainly hearing from the controller's um, recommendation as well, is that there's urgency around um, bringing all of that data um, to light and I so so let me ask you on on that front is it possible to do a I'm going to just call it a pilot program I mean, can we take public works and department of building inspection staff and um, move them you know online as you know a, a first initiative so that we can start to bring that information into the you know public domain. That's I mean it's something I can discuss with the staff. Um, I mean it'll require a little bit of planning outside of this meeting. Right. I'm not asking you. Yeah. Say I think what we're all struggling with is um, it was uh, it wasn't clear from our discussion in July. At least it wasn't clear to me that. Um, the time that we've lost uh, was going to specifically um, put us back a whole year. I mean, I you know, it's like the idea that we're going to bring somebody on in January, and um, but the filing deadline. I mean, that's you know, a year and three months later, we're really losing um, the benefit of that position. I guess, and then just to get my other comments in, you know, one of the things I'm looking at in is is not only the resources that we need anew in this budget allocation, but there is a point where I think we really need to look hard at this disaster service work, um, you know, assignment issue as it impacts the ethics commission. Um, going back to Commissioner Chu's comments about the, um, difficult and, you know, situation that we find ourselves in with these, these um, corruption revelations, notwithstanding 
that we're also dealing with a once in a hundred years pandemic. The the and it, and I really do honor and appreciate the responsibility that our staff have taken on to serve as disaster service workers. But if you're looking at our audit division, where we have these budget and legislative analysts and our own internal conclusion that we're unable to do even what the charter requires us to do, and now we're down to staff people. And as you pointed out, because they share responsibility for the public financing program along with the audit program, whatever time we have available from existing staff is going to be focused on getting through the November election. So we're literally going to lose six whole months of our entire staff on audits. And that, you know, from a compliance and enforcement point of view, that's just you know, that's the message that um, it's more important to have these folks because they are very capable doing, yes, very important work, but but maybe it's time to have that conversation with the mayor's office and where, with the HR about, you know, um, seeking resources from departments that are much, much larger and maybe better able to handle um, the, the loss of half of an entire division. But anyway, those are my my thoughts of the moment. I do want to allow um, Mr. Massey to get back to putting the facts in front of us. If we if there's something immediate, um, I'll take comments. Otherwise, I'm going to give the floor back to either Commissioner, I mean, either Director Pelham or uh, Mr. Massey. I'd like to make one comment if I can. Okay. I'm quoting directly from Executive Director Pelham's uh, report under impacts of items not addressed. And the very last column says, without taking steps now to provide team leads, supervisors and managers in the city with workforce with the tools to support the practical applications of ethics laws and their day-to-day -day work, corrupt practices will continue to go unchecked and the city will miss a vital opportunity to create and sustain the right tone at the top. Now, if we're in ethics putting out a statement that says corrupt practices will continue to go unchecked, that ought to set off alarms across all of City Park. Certainly does for me. I think, I think that's a headline. Well, and, and certainly not funding the, the efforts that would be needed to check those corrupt practices also sends a message that not only that you know, we, we don't have, we don't, we don't have resources now, and the resources that we're asking for are unavailable to us or are, are not being allocated you know, exactly. in the time of crisis. Exactly. And, and, and this rests squarely with, with, the, with the, the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and that, uh, to Commissioner Bush's point earlier, that what they're saying is that it's okay. It's okay that we don't fund the Ethics Commission. And the, and the work that's needed to check corruption because we think it's just fine. We think things, there are other things that are more important from a budget standpoint. And that to me is just not acceptable. Just, just to be clear, it's, it's, not, to make it's not the board yet though. This is the mayor's proposal. I mean, so far what we saw at the board budget committee was some interest in further supporting ethics commission funding. Um, so, there's right. So the reason and the mayor, yeah. But not to make this yeah, the mayor, not, not to make this uh, political in any way, but it's worth noting that in a few months, six members of the board are going to be up for election, and you think any of them are going to want to run on a platform that says that corruption will go unchecked? Great point. Great point. Great point. Like, um, somebody's on um, I'm sorry I I thought I was getting reconnected but apparently I'm causing a problem so I'll back out <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, would you like me to continue or at this point? 
Oh, the audio is really bad. Themselves just to see if we can improve this problem. I don't think okay. it was my my audio. Can can you hear me? Yes, I'm I can hear you. I'm on my cell phone Thank again. You. Can you all hear me? And am I not? no longer creating a problem? Uh, yes, yes, Commissioner Thank Smith, you. that's much better. Thank you. Sorry okay. for that problem. <laughs> no, it was interesting audio. <laughs> Here we go. All right, um, if we can go back then to Mr. Massey. Sure, so, uh, and let me give you a little more context to this information systems engineer position. So uh, that, that position was actually, uh, being tied to this this COIT project was responsible for all the commission's various data systems, uh, e-filing projects, the, the contractor ban disclosure uh, forms that are filed with the board and the mayor's office, the commission's website, and most importantly, developing and updating the commission's campaign finance dashboards and data. So with the discontinuation of that position and the election coming up, we felt it was critical to maintain those core campaign finance resources, the website and other data systems, uh, as opposed to bringing a new system online. So we actually, because we had a vacancy in the 1053 information business analyst position and this 1042 position was being uh, eliminated, we actually would have only been down to two FTEs in, the tech, in this technology division. And so we were going to have some core systems that would be unsupported by any staff. Um, so the reason we were able to fill that 1053 position is that we did communicate this to the mayor's budget office and DHR, and they allowed us to expeditiously fill that 1053 position so we would have three on staff that still didn't satisfy the needs for the Form 700 project. Um, so, if we look at these four divisions that I've been talking about, and we come back to the attrition savings issue, in sum, so if we have the six month hiring delays for the policy position and audit supervisor, so we keep those as 0.5 FTEs, and, and don't hire them until January 2021, and we keep the investigator position vacant, and we freeze hiring of any temp staff for two years, we'll be able to meet the attrition savings target for 2021 and 2022. Now I'd like to take a moment and discuss how this budget is, whether this budget's in alignment with the various reports that have been coming out. So because the controller's June 29th report recommendations were available for review by the mayor's budget office before the mayor's proposal was finalized, the mayor's office was able to restore positions required to deliver on three of the recommendations in the report. But the work cannot commence until January 2021 at the earliest under their proposal. So one, this includes the 4700 project that we just talked about. So they are providing a new position, the 1840 customer support specialist, but not until January 2021. And they're bringing back the IS engineer, but not until 2021. They also recommended that we conduct annual compliance reviews. This is related to reviewing Form 700s. Uh, it it uh, also authorizes hiring uh, the 1824 audit supervisor, which would be needed to do that kind of review. But again, it's not effective until January 2021. Uh, the report also recommends an examination of gift loopholes. Uh, this, this work on, on top of the commission's existing policy priorities is going to require more than one person at the helm. And the budget proposal does include authorizing filling that position, even during the hiring freeze, but again, not until January 2021. Um, they also have provided uh, an increase to the commission's uh, DHR work order budget. 
and that will effectively allow us to have the support of a 0.5 FTE analyst at DHR to help with hiring, and then in the subsequent fiscal year, a, a full-time analyst at DHR. Now, on the BLA audit, it's not completely in alignment. Uh, it's something we're still reviewing, but uh, two things to note here. Uh, one of the recommendations uh, about expediting the approval of request to fill vacant positions, again, we have to keep that 1822 investigator position vacant. Uh, and in addition, uh, there was the recommendation to establish and formalize uh, sufficient training for the audit and enforcement staff, but at the same time, the budget is cutting uh, over half of our training budget uh, in, in both fiscal years. So at the committee, uh, Director Pelham uh, asked the board to reduce the commission's attrition target so we can hire the vacant 1822 investigator position. Uh, this will require the attrition targets to be reduced by 75,000 in fiscal year 21 and 150,000 in fiscal year 22. Uh, staff has reached out to the mayor's office after the committee's meeting, and we plan to meet in the coming days to reach agreement on the attrition savings target. Uh, in addition, Director Pelham addressed the, the commission's proposal to establish a practical ethics training program for city employees. Uh, this proposal was originally made in the commission's February budget, but is not included in the commission's revised budget proposal because the proposal requires a mandatory 10% cut to the base operating budget when it's made. Uh, so Director Pelham raised this issue for the, the committee. Uh, may, I think at this point, maybe it would be a good idea to stop there and see if there are any further questions or other areas that um, the, the commissioners would like to look into as far as this budget. I'm gonna ask a quick procedural question. So from a timing, point of view, you had the uh, initial uh, committee hearing at, with the board on the 12th. Um, and just to be clear, un unlike the usual scripted protocol where the department is expected to um, smile uh, you know, willingly when the mayor makes a recommendation, I think that the director and the department made the case that this commission has been insisting on that um, more was required. And so now you're having a follow-up meeting, I gather with the mayor's budget staff, that's what you're referring to here. And then will you go back to committee at the board or does this all roll over to a meeting of the whole at the board of supervisors for disposition of the entire city budget? At, at this time, we're not scheduled for a follow-up with the Budget and Appropriations Committee. It would go to the full board. Because, you know, at the budget hearing, as I was listening, I did hear particularly Supervisor Ronan expressing her uh, view that um, positions needed to be funded at the Ethics Commission. But I also heard Chair Fewer say, we're not really in the mode of asking departments what they need. We're asking departments what they can give up. Um, and, and, and it left me with the impression that they were going to have another meeting and find out what, what departments really wanted. But I, ga I gather that's not the case, that what the board, the chair of the budget committee anyway, was saying. Um, in any event, they did, they did seem to say that they, there would be an opportunity for the board to take up ad backs. So you're having a meeting with the mayor's office. Are you, uh, is there any outreach to any members of the board to see if they'd support you with um, ad backs to the mayor's budget? And I'll let executive director Pelham respond. Yeah, at this point, I think that's a, a, a very, um, very good suggestion, um, Chair, uh, Chair Ambrose. The uh, original scheduling of, uh, of the board's uh, budget and appropriations committee made very clear that there were certain departments that had one hearing and, and will not have a second hearing before the committee. There is no reason that we cannot ask uh, to, to, to reach out individually, but also just simply ask for a second hearing. We will know more hopefully after our conversation with the mayor's budget office on, on, the, on Tuesday uh, of next week, uh, when we have a chance to, to meet with them. Uh, I think one of the things that was notable on Wednesday's discussion before the committee is that there was very little, if any, questioning about the need for an ethics at work program. There seemed there was 
Supervisor Ronan mentioned the need to have an investigator on staff with the commission, particularly at this time. Uh, but we have not really seen a lot of questions or, uh, and I don't know that I can read that as interest, but we haven't had questions about the need for supporting city officials and workers with uh, stronger ethics training by establishing an ethics training team in our office. So we certainly could reach out and, and ask for uh, additional consideration by the board. Yeah, and I, I don't presume to do your job, I mean, in terms of your, um, how you um, connect with and inform, you know, if not the supervisors themselves, but their legislative aides. And it's been a while since I've um, been in the budget um, process mix. I'm just um, want to make sure everybody understands that we are in the middle of the process. We haven't been turned down and, and we are very much at the point where applying pressure is what everybody else is doing right now, um, trying to keep their needs at the top of everyone's um, recollection, you know, at least up to the point where um, they don't um, stop listening to us. So I just wanted to know how how um, how much opportunity you thought you had for that. And I, I guess my sense isn't that we need another public hearing at the board. My sense is that we need to pick a couple of the supervisors who were on the budget committee or otherwise previously expressed um, some sympathy, whether it was in saying that we don't need a public advocate because the ethics commission just needs to be fixed or so on. I mean, those are people that hopefully, given how in the overall scheme of things, as Commissioner Chu was pointing out, our, our, we're a drop in the bucket. I mean, the money is is there, not, not a plenty, but it is conceivable that these things could be supported, whether it's by work order from another revenue stream or um, directly, and whether it's short term or with promises to look at it again <laughs> after we see how things go next year. But um, anyway, so that's that's my two cents. I'm going to let um, uh, Commissioner Bush speak because he's waving his hand at me, and then Commissioner Chu. I I, I want to say that I concur with uh, Chair Ambrose's view of what Chair Fewer was saying which is that there should be another chance to revisit these issues and rather than just accept that they were. Um, I would also say that my experience is that if you can show officials that you are not inventing something new, but rather implementing something that was always part of our mission, that you are gonna be more successful. People are cautious about adopting something new, like ethics at work looks like it's new. In fact, it's not new. If you go back and look at the 1993 charter, it was a pass by the voters. It required that the Ethics Commission establish a manual, that it establish annual training for all top city officials on ethics. All the things that are in ethics at work are spelled out specifically, not in general terms, but specifically in the 1993 charter. So I would suggest that you revisit that and that you also uh, uh, share that with the people who will be making decisions, including the mayor's office. It, it, there was a revision of the charter later on, but that revision did not repeal these provisions. Those provisions still are part of the law. Okay, um, Commissioner Chu, did you? Uh I would like to associate myself with Commissioner Bush's remarks and also emphasize that not only it, not only is it required by law, but it hasn't been done. And so here's their opportunity to meet that need and to demonstrate to the people of San Francisco that they take com compliance and anti-corruption very seriously. And I, I would also uh, suggest that we rely on the findings of the BLA audit. So it's not just what the Ethics Commission wants. It's also uh, uh, contained in the numerous recommendations um, you know, identified as some of the highest priority coming out of uh, the controller's department that these resources be deployed in that manner. So I would be very much in support of, of you know, going back and, and um, you know, communicating with, you know, the committee or, you know, whoever 
uh, executive director and others, you know, would be deemed the, the appropriate audience uh, to make our case. Okay. And if there aren't any further comments from commissioners, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Massey. Did you have further slide presentation? No, that concludes the update that I plan to give the commission. All right, so then I'm gonna go back to Director Pelham um, for any remarks and comments and then one more. Uh, well, actually, then I'm gonna to go to public comment and then we'll wrap up with commissioner comments. I, I, I have no, uh, nothing of substance to add. I think the, the feedback that you've all provided about next steps and the reminders about reaching out to the board is something that we will definitely pursue and um, follow up with you uh, as needed, uh, Chair Ambrose. Uh, but we will keep you in the loop and make every effort to, to to make our case as much as we can. Right. So our meeting in September. Yeah. If you can get back to us on the dates, I just so we meet in September on. I believe it's the eleventh. Eleventh. Um, and I don't know what the schedule is for the board, but I would like to know that when when <laughs> the hearings will be on the budget if they have have forecast those dates so we know um, we can talk more about um, how we might um, continue to weigh in. Um, with that, uh, moderator, if you could please see if we have any public commenters in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on agenda item number seven, discussion of ethics commission annual budget as proposed by the mayor's office for year, fiscal year 20, 2020 to 2021 and 21 to 22. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Madam Chair, we have one caller so far on the queue. Thank you. Give me just one second. I do apologize. Hello, caller. Your three minutes yes. begins now. Yes, uh, good morning again. This is Dr. Derek Kerr. Um, your funding mechanism means that you're not independent because you're beholden to the people who approve your budget. Year after year, you have to bow and scrape before the very same people that you are monitoring for misconduct. It's hard to bite the hand that feeds you. So this system inhibits your ability to investigate high level officials at City Hall. One solution is to get a automatic portion of the budget, much like the controller's city services auditor they get, I think, 0.2% of the budget every year and don't have to seek approval for anybody. Ethics could get 0.1% of the budget every year. I realize this would require a change in the charter, but it would make you independent and would restore public confidence in your ability to reduce corruption in the city. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comment. Are there any other commenters in the queue? I'm checking the chair. Chair, there are no more callers. Okay, um, I, I'm not muted. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that um, please anticipate that the budget will be back on the calendar in September. 
um, depending on the date when the board is going to act, hopefully, um, well, I don't know, hopefully we'll get what we asked for and um, we'll be celebrating. Um, in any event, uh, we will have an opportunity to discuss where we're at at that time and how we're going to go forward. Um, I also would like to, in that um, context, because we're, I believe we're also going to have our policy um, prioritization plan on for discussion, I want to talk in the context of both of those things about performance metrics um, and how we'll, um, you know, set goals for ourselves as part of that. This is my personal pitch. I really do want to look at at least pulling some subset of Form 700 filers online as if we can't get the whole 3,500 up and running as a, a test pilot. I, I just think that waiting an entire another year before we bring that um, information forward and also just that level of attention to the seriousness with which the city takes the responsibility of these high level decision makers in city government to be um, thoughtful and, and uh, thorough in their disclosure of their relationships and financial interest. And I think that there's going to be um, considerable attention paid once they realize that that information is not sitting locked away in some secretary's filing cabinet. So um, I, I, if, if we can't do all of them because we don't have the positions, I, I want you to at least look at your staffing allocations. And then the other thing is I do want to come back on the DSW. I don't know who we talked to um, in city government. Um, and I, I totally understand why they love your the staff because they've got the kind of you know um, computer uh, writing you know excel spreadsheet capabilities that um, are probably really useful at the emergency operations center but i do want them to recognize you know how, how much uh you know taking the number of staff people that you've um provided affects a department as small as the, you know, ethics commission department. So anyway, those are my two themes. And um, now I'm going to ask if the other commissioners have comments and suggestions um, before we close out this item. Everybody said their piece. Commissioner Smith, is there anything that you wanted to say on the phone? Well, I will only say that this experience of being uh, connected by phone only proves the adage, one picture is worth a thousand words, because I did feel handicapped by not being able to see Mr. Massey's power presentation, but that wasn't anybody's fault uh, other than the power failure in my building. So yeah. uh, I am. I did find the, the, my colleague, co-commissioners, -com um, analyses and comments very helpful, uh, but I don't feel equipped, frankly, to say anything in addition to that, other than I'm sorry this happened. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry for you too on the hottest day of the year so far in San Francisco, not having your power is not a good thing. So hopefully they get you back online soon. Um, and then I am then going to I guess I didn't actually know that I think, but I closed public comment and I'm going to move on and call agenda item number eight, which would be two pages on. Um, agenda item eight, discussion of the monthly staff policy report. Um, if any members of the public intend to offer public comment for this item, they should dial in now and enter star three to be added to the public comment queue. Before we hear public comment, though, I'm going to ask Pat Ford uh, for his presentation. I would ask the commissioners, if you can hold your questions and comments until we hear from Mr. Ford and the public, um, just to move through this item in light of my 
overall deadline. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ambrose. Uh, this is Pat Ford, Senior Policy and Legislative Affairs Council. Um, I'll be very quick since I know we're in a bit of a time crunch. Um, I think you can see from this month's policy report and also you heard from Director Pelham that there are a number of overarching issues and projects that have really consumed a lot of us in the office um, over the last couple of months um, between the, the ongoing budget discussions, um, the BLA audit, and also uh, we've been working with the controller's office to um, help give them feedback on the reports that uh, that office is doing. That's really um, occupied a, a lot of my time and a lot of time of others in the office, as I'm sure you've heard and we'll, we'll continue to hear. Um, so that's really what this report is about, um, is focusing on those and uh, really just uh, make myself available for comments. I'll just end, end it there. Commissioner Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair Ambrose. <clears throat> um, and Mr. Ford, I just had a quick question about the public advocate ballot measure. Do you have any more insight or context around why the Board of Supervisors decided not to place that measure on the uh, November 2020 ballot? Yes, I do. Uh, from watching the meeting where, where that vote took place, um, it was a close vote. It, it was six opposed, five, four. Um, placing the measure on the ballot. Um, so it, it failed by one vote. And I heard a, a few things from those who voted against placing the measure on the ballot. But I think the two most common themes were one, that it was not an appropriate time to create um, a new um, office, a new department, considering the financial situation of the city. Um, and two, that there are already mechanisms and entities in the city that are responsible for doing what the public advocate was envisioned to do. And the Ethics Commission was one of those uh, entities that was discussed. They also talked about the controller's office and the city attorney's office, but they did mention us and, and they said, we, we have an ethics commission. They're supposed to already be uh, be looking for corruption and enforcing against corruption. So let's you know, stick with what we have. Um, so hopefully that means that there's also some energy like we've been talking about with the budget to, you know, empower us to, to really do that work. I would hope that, that the, the funds that would have otherwise gone to, to support and um, resource this new public advocate position will, will be theoretically directed uh, into the Ethics Commission budget. But thank you for that update. That's helpful. When, um, Commissioner Bush. Uh, I also listened to that. I would just uh, point out that the public advocate ballot measure would not have come into effect for almost two years. It was going to take quite a while to get going. And secondly, it did include uh, whistleblower uh, provisions, but those provisions uh, were attenuated by a variety of restrictions as to how they got handled. And I went onto the controller's webpage to read their whistleblower report. And their report is quarterly, and the third quarter had come out not too long ago. And it shows that, in fact, there is some attention being given to the complaints uh, filed by whistleblowers. They're not showing up uh, with retaliation in ethics, but they're showing up to some extent at the controller's office. And they're, they're thoroughly hair raising, you know. Uh, sexual harassment on the job, preferential contracting, all the kinds of things that you really want to see put a stop to. There probably are things that need to be changed in the whistleblower law. Uh, uh, in my view, they certainly are. But uh, in general, I wanna go back. Uh, you said that in your report that the, the FPPC is looking at behested payments and can you tell us a little bit more about what it is that they're looking at specifically? Because as you know, the Hested payments was one route used for uh, corrupt purposes in this past year in San Francisco. And it's entirely legal under the current Hested payments policies, which San Francisco could adopt its own to create a nonprofit, even a government arm 
and seek outside funding to pay for it. So for example, the Ethics Commission could create uh, an arm of the Ethics Commission and then go to people and ask for it to be funded. That's what George Gassoni did when he was the district attorney. He asked for several hundred thousand dollars to be raised and spent on furnishing his office, including the chair he sat in. All of that was viewed as legitimate because the Hess attainments cover educational, charitable, or governmental purposes. And we've had mayors who used nonprofits to pay for things like the America's Cup or the 100th anniversary of San Francisco City Hall, in which they raised millions of dollars from people who had business before the city. They also that paid their own staff people to be staffers on the nonprofit. So when looking at redoing the behest of payments, it seems to me that it would be prudent to have a provision that says, you cannot seek a behest of payment to go for the benefit of your office or to pay for members of your family or members of your staff. Is any of that being contemplated? Uh, at this point, I think that the FPPC's project is still in its early stages. Um, at the latest meeting of their law and policy subcommittee, which is where this project is taking place, they just now finalized their calendar of how they'll be undertaking the project. So they're still at a, at a very early stage. And honestly, I, I don't know how uh, how broad the, the project will be, but I will you know, gladly keep you up to date on, on what I'm learning. And um, I, I definitely will be sharing what our experience has been. Um, I think one interesting um, vignette that we can contribute to their project is the experience that the commission had with the ACAO and the behested payment provisions that were in that law and kind of what we were trying to do with that provision and why it ultimately was not part of the ordinance and what we heard from the community. So uh, also, I think some of the things that you've spoken to, um, hopefully we'll be talking about next month as well when the um, policy prioritization plan will be on the agenda. And um, I will be uh, recommending that we do a conflict of interest um, project mostly in response to the corruption investigations that are ongoing. Uh, but I think it could definitely incorporate some of the things that you're highlighting right now, Commissioner Bush. I think I, I would underscore uh, looking at uh, incompatible activities as they're listed by each department. For example, the planning department allows commissioners to raise money for nonprofits that have business before the planning commission. I hardly need to spell out what that could mean. Um, if I may, I just had a quick um, comment to uh, Mr. Ford. <clears throat> that okay? Um, you know, I'm, I I realize that you um, have been uh, on the front lines, as it were, with the work remote as it was, it was still very much hands-on and answering questions for the budget and legislative an analyst. And I do want to make a point to commend the staff in that. Um, I've seen a lot of, of Harvey Rose's reports over the years. And I think that in, in many respects, it was, a, it was a very helpful report, but it also reflected that they respected the, the uh, cooperation of the staff and providing information and engaging with them in a positive way as opposed to what can sometimes happen where departments become defensive and try and hide the ball. And I, I just wanna thank you all for the effort that you all put into to inform and educate and just answer all the many questions that I'm sure you've all had to to deal with, so thank you for that. I also think um, that your point about a conflict of interest focus for the um, fall quarter is kind of online with um, what we've all been talking about today because notwithstanding the unavailability maybe of all of the resources that, that we need, we do have, apropos the discussion on the public advocate, we do have 
allies in the city attorney's office and the controller's office and the district attorney's office, especially with the new district attorney's office. And, and frankly, probably I would imagine also in DHR and in some of the um, personnel uh, leads and departments who are lucky enough to have their own personnel staff. Um, and that from, from that kind of liaisoning where you're probably the one in the department that's most connected to other departments, maybe also the enforcement division. Anyway, I would just want to encourage as much as possible, given how difficult it is with everybody not being at City Hall, you know, to, to reach out and see what other departments are doing in response to the corruption investigation and the revelations that are coming out and what what their experience is in their budget um, review and whether or not we're going to have the kind of support that um, we might be able to look to from the controller's office or city attorney or DA. Just, you know, maybe um, just uh, check in with the city family and, and see where that's all at. And then I would just say, well, I think we're all looking forward to getting some answers and getting a plan and getting to work on some of these important things. So you'll be very much part of that and look forward to um, whatever, just tackling whatever comes our way. All right, Mr. Bush, um, one last comment and then I wanna to go to item number nine. Thank you, I appreciate it, no. Chair Ambrose. Uh, I, indeed, looking at what other agencies are doing and whether we can learn anything from them, it's gonna be very illuminating. Uh, I noticed that in Los Angeles, they are having uh, the kind of corruption issues there that we are seeing here with a number of people who've been arrested and charged who are city officials over the same kind of uh, payoffs and rigging that we see here. There's a lot of money to be made by people getting decisions that are favorable to them. And we can't pretend that that's not a <laughs> motivating factor. In that respect, I'd like to suggest that you examine, and perhaps report back to us on whether you could reach out to some nonprofit groups that are well versed in this, like the Brennan Institute uh, in back east or the uh, campaign ethics uh, committee uh, at the federal level. We used to be head of the, the uh, federal government's ethics thing. So they have been very helpful in the past to the F San Francisco Ethics Commission in drafting proposals. And I think that they would be helpful again. So I recommend that that be included in your presentation next month. Yeah, I, I I will absolutely do that. I think I, it's been very helpful in past policy projects. Okay, and and maybe then at that time too, we'll talk about you know what other because um, I know Commissioner Bush, you've been bringing this to my attention. Um, if we can in September, also plan to talk about what we might do to um, engage in outreach for funding to not just the Brennan, but to other organizations. Because I had asked um, our city attorney, uh, Andrew Shen, to be prepared to explain to us what what it means to solicit, receive, process through the city budget um, our finances. But in light of the time that we have for remaining items, I was actually, I think it might be better to put that on for September. Um, so, uh, Andrew, if you can be prepared to educate us all about what it, what it means to um, solicit, seek, and obtain funding um, from outside sources. By September 2, we'll know how well we did with the city and, and what, our, um, what our missing pieces are. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm happy to address that issue in September. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks so much. Um, I just realized, notwithstanding that I said we were gonna take public comment before the commissioners jumped in, I'm pretty sure we all jumped in before we asked for public comment. So um, Mr. Moderator, can you please let us know if there are any public commenters on item number eight? Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair <clears throat> we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. 
If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on agenda item eight, discussion of monthly staff policy. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers. All right, then. I am going to close public comment on agenda item eight, and I'm going to call agenda item nine, and that would be the discussion of the monthly staff enforcement report. If there are any members of the public that intend to offer public comment for this item, they can dial in now and enter star three to be added to the public comment queue. Um, but first, we're going to hear from um, Mr. Pierce um, and commissioners. I am going to ask that we hold our questions and comments um, until we hear from the public. So, if, well, actually, maybe I'm going to stop for a second since obviously that's not the way we proceeded before. If you would prefer, we can do questions to um, Mr. Pierce as his presentation um, unfolds or uh, and then after discussion, then we can ask for public comment if that's the way you'd rather proceed. So anyone wants public comment first, raise their hand. Um, seeing none, I'm gonna say then commissioners, we're gonna engage in discussion and then we'll ask for public comment. So go ahead, Mr. Pierce. Okay, thank you, Chair Ambrose. So I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, the, I'm sure all of you have had a chance to read the report. Um, some of the remarks, uh, in a sense, reflect what um, Senior Policy Council Pat Ford had to say about projects that have occupied staff's time over the last many weeks. Um, I would note uh, one item, which is uh, that uh, we're pleased to welcome John Gollinger to the District Attorney's Office. Um, we had a productive conversation over the last month about uh, how our respective offices might share information and collaborate on ethics related matters, obviously uh, within the limits of due process considerations or other constitutional protections. But you will remember uh, Mr. Gollinger as a, a highly motivated advocate before the Ethics Commission on matters related to public financing and, and other issues of, of government ethics. Um, my report also notes that um, like uh, our engagement with Mr. Nollinger, we continue to meet weekly with counterparts in the controller's office, the city attorney's office, and the district attorney's office. Um, so to Commissioner Bush's point about what the overall role of the commission is vis-a-vis -vis these other, what we call accountability departments, um, I, I believe that those relationships are strong and healthy and that we um, have developed useful ways of sharing uh, information and triaging which departments might be best situated to handle which kinds of complaints. Um, apart from that, I, I guess I would note uh, only a couple of things from the BLA update, or sorry, the BDR, the Bureau of Delinquent Revenue update this month. Uh, the Commission's Fines Collection Officer, Ernestine Braxton and I had a call with several staff members from the Bureau uh, earlier this month regarding the Bureau's approach to collections at this time. The, the Bureau has effectively paused their collection efforts uh, in light of the economic downturn that has resulted from the pandemic. Uh, the Bureau, I think, more recently is going to resume some of those collection efforts, but adopting a somewhat softer approach. Um, they will not, for example, be filing small claims actions in Superior Court. Um, so in the report where you see the status listed as penned to mail small claims final demand letter in several instances, uh, what that means is that the 
the Bureau will not be sending those letters um, until the Bureau can uh, effectively file a, a small claims matter. So the um, state law would pre prevent them from threatening a lawsuit that they don't intend to, to file. Um, and similarly, the Bureau is not engaging in um, like wage garnishment or property taxation or, or other methods of collection at this time. They've paused all of those things. Um, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, so I have a question then um, about that. I understand the impetus for uh, to uh, slow down or delay uh, these collection efforts. And that, does that in any way um, uh, jeopardize the ability then in the future to go after these payments? Is there Are there any kind of statute of limitations issues that we're going to be running up against? Because uh, I, I wouldn't want to foreclose the opportunity for the city to be able to recoup uh, these uh, these uh, amounts, um, you know, you know, due to the pandemic. And I do want to be sensitive to that, but at the same time, you know, many of these have been pending for a long time. So, for example, one has been the very first one was referred in 2016. Um, so that's four years ago. Uh, committee to elect member for supervisor was referred. So this was the, ref the referral date to BDR, not for the underlying violation, um, you know, uh, May 1st, 2015. And so uh, in my question is, is that you know, if this, if this uh, deferral uh, would otherwise jeopardize the ability to collect, and I, I would not want, I would, I, would, I would want there to be a balancing uh, taken uh, to that approach so that we don't foreclose the opportunity to recoup these costs or these fines. I appreciate that concern, uh, Commissioner Chu, and the Bureau has not yet expressed to me any any risk in that regard, but I will follow up with them to make sure that they are considering it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I actually had one other question was um, this new, <clears throat> new role that assistant district attorney uh, Gollinger will be playing. Like, what are the implications for the, the ethics commission? I, I understand that the, the, the hope and the expectation will be greater collaboration, but will that, does this mean now that though, from a practical standpoint, that they'll, you will have more uh, visibility and insight into, for example, investigation holds that, um, that the ethics commission places on matters that are being referred in order for the district attorney to be able to you know, pursue its own investigation? Will there be a little bit more you know, transparency or and, you know, communication uh, in, in that regard? So I don't 100% understand the structure in the district attorney's office. I don't believe that Mr. Gollinger is, uh, I could be wrong, but I don't believe that he's in the white collar division, which is where our counterparts have generally been um, for, uh, these collaborative efforts on overlapping jurisdiction. I think he's in the special investigations team. That having been said, uh, he certainly has access to, access to them and speaks w with his counterparts in the white collar division routinely and has offered uh, in, increased communication between our office and that division wherever he can be helpful. Um, so in the, I can't predict in the, in the long run what it, could mean practically, and I'll, I'll have to explore a little bit more fully what the structure of the district attorney's office is to better understand what role they envision Mr. Dollinger might play. Thank you. I think you're, you're muted off, Chair. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Bush, um, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, when you've done this grid of uh, the status of various complaints, can you add to that uh, at least the number, if not the identifiers, uh, on the complaints that were referred to the district attorney and the city attorney and to any uh, relevant city agencies for their action? Uh, I think it'd be good for us to know how many of those complaints are pending there and how long they've been pending. Because I think that the at one point, the commission, the ethics commission, adopted a policy that after a certain period of time, they could be undertaken for enforcement by the commission itself if the city attorney or the district attorney didn't 
begin taking action. I don't remember if that was like 30 days or 60 days, however long it was. Um, with that, in sending it to some departments like to MTA or the police department, you're sending it to a department that is overseen by political appointees. And that may make someone who's filed a complaint concerned that it's being swept aside for political purposes. So it would seem prudent to have anything that was referred to a department headed by political appointees re-referred back to ethics with a, a conclusion about what they did rather than simply have it disappear. For example, uh, the complaint that was originally against Mohammed Daru for sex harassment uh, uh, and failing to act on sex harassment and was sent to his supervisor, which was at that time the way the policy worked and the supervisor did nothing with it uh, except to promote him. Um, and so uh, there was never a response that came back until you went to court and sued. And that's a, a problem for the city's budget as well. So that's the request I'm making. Sure, I appreciate the question. We we can um, we can look to include data about the number of matters that are pending with the city attorney or district attorney and um, explore ways of reporting that. To your question about referrals to departments headed by political appointees, I think you're right that the I believe Article Four, the Whistleblower Protection Ordinance, empowers the commission to require from those departments a response about what steps they may have taken with respect to any referral. What I'm less certain of is that the reason that we make those referrals is that we lack jurisdiction to pursue them ourselves. And so although we, in theory, could uh, receive reports from those departments, we wouldn't have wherewithal to require them to, to do anything. So if, if no report comes back or if uh, the report comes back and, and we disagree with the outcome. Because we lack jurisdiction, I'm not sure that we could um, seek or impose a, a different outcome, but I'm happy to consult with the city attorney's office on that. Thank you. I, if it turns out that we don't have the authority, and we should, and, and if the conclusion uh, by the commission is that we should have authority, then that might be a loophole that we want to close. I mean, let's say a president, any president that you care to name who's an incumbent, puts up reelect me posters in all the post offices. Uh, and by the way, don't count on vote by mail. Uh, we make that an objection. Point taken. Just a little snark to keep it going. Um, Commissioner Chu, is your hand up or is that just... No, that's from before. I'll okay. take it down now. All right. And Commissioner Lee or Commissioner Smith, did you have any comments, comments. questions? I did not. Thank you for asking. All right. Then I'm going to ask our moderator to see if there's any um, public comment on this uh, item number nine. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on agenda item number nine, discussion of monthly staff enforcement report. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you are in line with a, if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you when you have thirty seconds remaining. Please stand by. Uh, Mr. Moderator, while you're waiting for public commenters, I'll add one clarification, which I received by email from Mr. Gollinger himself, who was tuning into our meeting. And he wanted us to know that, in fact, the uh, division that he belongs to, the Special Prosecutions Unit, is a division of the White Collar Division. So. Um, so he, he has uh, immediate and direct interface with those folks. Madam Chair, we have no callers in the queue. Uh-oh. 
Madam Chair, can you hear me? I am muted. <laughs> no um, so with that, public comment is closed. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pierce. And we will proceed with agenda item 10, uh, discussion of executive director's report, an update of various programmatic and operational highlights of ethics commission staff activities since the commission's previous meeting. Director Pellum, please. Thank you, Chair. It's a very brief report this month since most of the, the, the items have been addressed in uh, earlier agenda items. The BLA audit report was linked here for reference of the public who may be following the monthly report, as was the, uh, the budget report that Stephen Massey presented to you. Uh, this, I, the only highlight I would add from this report at this time is the public financing uh, program. Uh, since the commission last met in July, we had, I think at that time, candidates running for the supervisorial races on the November 2020 ballot had qualified to receive roughly $800,000 in public financing at that point in time. Since the last meeting, we have had six more candidates qualify to receive public financing in connection with their campaigns in November. That brings us now to 59% of the candidates who stated their interest in participating. 59% of them now have in fact qualified to receive public funds. And as of August 7th, our, uh, our staff had determined that uh, candidates had qualified to receive a total of $1.66 million, so over a million and a half dollars uh, in qualified uh, uh, distributions to candidates who agreed to participate and were certified to be eligible for November. Um, I would also add just one last note about our audits. We uh, now uh, have all but one of the publicly financed candidates from 2018. Uh, their audit work has been completed. Those audits are finalized and will be posted in the coming days on our website. We have one audit remaining outstanding and then as soon as that is uh, finalized, uh, we will make sure to, to get that out uh, to, the, to the committees and to the public. Uh, lastly, we do list in this report from the Form 700 annual filing deadline that was extended this year to June 1st because of the COVID emergency. Uh, at this point, there were 18 filers who are required to file electronically either their Form 700 statement uh, or, well, they were required to file their Form 700 statement and a certificate of having completed ethics and sunshine training as required. 18 individuals who have that requirement this year have not yet filed uh, one or the other of those statements. And so they have been receiving non-filing notices from our office as a reminder that they do have the filing obligation. We uh, also have notified them if, uh, if they are a board and commission member currently of the no file, no vote requirement that prevents them from taking action on items on their meeting agendas. We've also sent this information, communicated this list to the city attorneys, so, uh, so the city attorney's office, so that those boards can also be uh, advised through that office and keep people from acting when they are not uh, uh, eligible to act until they file. And we are also communicating with them. Uh, we have another uh, a 90 day notice, uh, 30, 60 and 90 day notices that we're sending them. And we'll be asking them to file uh, and then after 90 days, that is the standard practice that we're adopting to refer those on as needed. So I just wanted to provide that highlight for you as that is uh, unlike, uh, undoubtedly a, a question about how we are handling any late filers. Uh, we did have roughly 96% filing uh, for the five, four 700s this year, which was notable, uh, I think, by all filers, given that we were in a pandemic environment and, and I'm sure a lot of officials had their, their focus elsewhere. So we do thank those who did file on time, but we wanted to provide you this list of those who had not at this point. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them for me. Uh, Chair Ambrose, I have a question for Director Pelham on this. Yes, please go ahead, Commissioner Chu. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Director Pelham. So with regard to the 18 uh, board members or commissioners who did not file and that uh, their failure to file their Form 700 or, and or complete their, their training uh, prohibits them from voting and that, uh, that the, they have a, their names have been, have been shared with the city attorney's office. Uh, and maybe this is a question for the deputy city attorney, but if, if they are prohibited from voting and in fact did vote, or partake in any sort of action, what are the legal implications of that, uh, of, 
of, of those votes and that um, are they are the staff members and the, the members themselves as well as the commission is aware that in an upcoming meeting, if they meet monthly, if they meet even more than monthly, that they are in fact prohibited from participating uh, in votes. I, I, I suppose they could uh, appear at the meeting, at least virtually at this point, you know, for quorum purposes, but that they cannot, that they're prohibited from taking action. Um, I just think that it is uh, important that there be teeth in the the enforcement of these of these. Um, restrictions and that the filing that people take their filing requirements uh, very seriously and comply with them. I would answer that, that I completely agree with you there. If, if somebody does um, act when they are prohibited from acting because of a no file, no vote provision, uh, that would be uh, a breach of the city's ethics law, the city's uh, campaign and, and uh, governmental uh, conduct code. Uh, but as to any actions that the city attorneys may be taking to advise and, and proactively get folks to file, I'm, I'm happy to defer to city attorney Chen on that. Or, excuse me, <laughs> Andrew Chen on that. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just very briefly. Um, so as as uh, Leanne has already mentioned, I have contacted my colleagues who advise their respective boards and commissions and alerted them to this non-filer issue, uh, and they are working with the commission secretaries to get people's filings um, on with the ethics commission. Um, and I would have to be honest, at this point, I'm not sure to what extent any of those commissioners actually did participate in meetings, despite the non-filing status. Um, I suspect many of those people have simply left city service or have not been in city meetings, at least during shelter in place. So I'm not honestly sure to what extent they have been participating, notwithstanding this issue. Thank you. Uh, so just a follow-up question, uh, Deputy City Attorney Shen, if they, if, if in fact they had not filed and they did participate in those meetings, what would the legal consequences be? Um, of, of those decisions? So the primary legal consequence of it would be any potential, um, we would notify their appointing authority of that issue as well. Um, the appointing authority could choose to obviously address that with their appointee, the commissioner. Uh, likewise, there is you know, potential you know, removal or other discipline of the commissioner from office if that continues to be a persistent problem. Um, but just to be clear, their vote, I mean, even if they attempted to vote, the vote wouldn't count. And I'm, I'm be curious if they would even count towards a quorum, but there's no reason to speculate, I guess, um, if that specific issue hasn't arisen, but clearly their vote wouldn't count if they were prohibited from voting. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely clear, to be honest with you, Chair Ambrose, uh, but again, I'm not sure if that's something we can actually speculate on because uh, it's not clear to me that a lot of these commissions have been participating uh, despite any non-filing status. Hmm. Okay, well, um, keep us surprised if um, they continue to not file and surf, um, but otherwise. Um, I, have a, I have a question about the form 700s that we're talking about here. Okay. Which is, uh, it's my understanding that the penalty, the financial penalty for non-filing is $10 a day and then caps out at $100. And after that, there is no additional penalty. Uh, that's, no, uh, to, to answer your question, Commissioner Bush, that's a late filing fee. So if, if somebody doesn't file timely, then it's a, a, a cap as you've described, a formula as you've described. If somebody who is required to file ultimately does not file, that could be handled as a different matter. And that could be handled through standard enforcement processes that are available. If that so is if necessary. they didn't file for six months, it'd still be capped and, the, and then they did file it would have been capped out at a hundred dollars uh, that's the way the state law is is written as i understand it yes and does san francisco have the flexibility to add a penalty to that if i could jump in uh okay. <clears throat> my my understanding of the law here is that the, the director is correct the late fee is capped at a hundred dollars but that late fees and enforcement actions are treated separately. And that in fact, the Fair Political Practices Commission does both things. They will assess late fees against late filed form 700s, but they may in egregious cases also bring enforcement actions against those same filers, which has apparently in practice caught some of those filers off guard. They had already paid their hundred dollars and they believed that it was behind them. Uh, but in San Francisco, my understanding is that we, we can do that as well. 
Can I ask a question? So from an enforcement point of view, let's just say somebody, it's not just a question of filing or not filing, but once we finally get to a point of ensuring compliance, somebody um, misfiled or didn't fully disclose, you're saying they're subject to an enforcement action um, by both the FPPC and San Francisco or or one or the other has jurisdiction over San Francisco filers. If you could clarify that for me. Sorry, what I what I meant to say was that the the process that the FPPC implements of assessing late fees on the one hand and pursuing enforcement actions on the other is available to us in San Francisco. I think the FPPC would retain jurisdiction to step in and do that even in San San Francisco. But as a practical matter, because they know that we might assert that jurisdiction. I think the FPPC would generally consult with us before they asserted local jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. I was just curious about whether or not they had fully delegated to state law that to local jurisdiction or if they had shared jurisdiction, so. Yeah, it's not a matter totally of delegation, but a matter of what local law provides for. Okay. Um, On a separate point, I just want to add my, uh, appreciation to executive director Pelham for juggling so many things over such a period of time. You've done a good job. I watched you testify before the board. And you did a good job there and you've done a good job of other stuff. So thank you. Yeah, and I uh, can all concur on that. Second thought. I am though gonna stop now and ask for public comment if that's okay on this item number 10. Moderate. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently talk taking public comment on agenda item number 10, discussion of executive director's report, an update of various programmatic and operational highlights of ethics commission staff activities since the commission's previous meeting. Please stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. All right, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Public comment is closed on agenda item 10, and I'm now gonna call agenda item 11. Discussion, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't ask um, Commissioner Smith. Um, I'm assuming you didn't have any comments because you didn't jump in. You're correct, you're correct. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, I would have spoken up. If All I right. Thank you very much, I just I wanna make sure you're not just sight unseen here. All right, agenda item 11, discussion and possible action on items for future meetings. And again, if any member of the public intend to offer public comment for this item, they should dial in now and enter star three to be added to the public comment queue. Can any of my commissioners, um, if you wanna raise your hand, if you have to, or if you want to identify matters for future meetings. And I see two hands from Commissioner Chu and Commissioner Bush. Your hand, you're gonna take your hand down. All right, Commissioner Bush then, please. I think you might be muted, Larry. Oh, how blessed you are. There you go. <laughs> um, what about establishing working groups? Because we have so much that we're handling uh, and it's, we only meet once a month. so. Would it be possible for a commissioner or two commissioners that are not a, does not reach the three commissioner threshold to confer with each other and uh, examine an issue that could then be brought back to the full commission at the next meeting? Is there any, any reason why that wouldn't be uh, something that would help us move things forward? So I hear nothing, so it must be okay, right? Um, I had actually asked, um, I, and I 
talk to you about this. I, I, I like the idea of, um, of having substantive um, matters, you know, being uh, informed by commissioner uh, or two uh, looking into things, but there are um, complications about officially establishing committees or specifically delegating as opposed to informally um, accepting, you know, recommendations from um, commissioners, you know, of course, two commissioners can talk without that um, representing a quorum and triggering various agenda and notice requirements. Um, but anyway, I'm going to ask uh, Deputy City Attorney Shen to explain the rules from the Sunshine Ordinance about um, officially designated or delegated committees so that we all understand what would be involved and how we might best approach this. Yeah, and just very briefly, um, this is not a prohibition at all, but additional things to keep in mind um, if the commission wants to take this route. Um, if the commission establishes any committees or subcommittees, any such officially constituted committees would be subject to Brown Act notice and public meeting requirements. <coughs> would have to post agendas, um, provide those 72 hours in advance of the meeting, and hold similar remote meetings for those committees as we do for the commission currently. So just something for everyone to keep in mind. Okay, and that's if we, it, it, when you say committee or subcommittee, so it doesn't matter, if, I mean, obviously if it was a quorum, you would have the same requirement that we have for a regular meeting, but you're saying even if, if we were to say two people get together and work on X, that would also make that committee almost like a board committee also subject to notice agenda and a internet meeting protocol. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good comparison, Chair Ambrose. So it would be similar to the board's rules committee or budget committee. When they get together and they're always less than the quorum of the full board, those committees are also subject to Brown Act notice and meeting requirements. Uh-huh. And if, But if, on the other hand, if... Um, Commissioner uh, um, Lee and I have a conversation about what we want on the agenda for September. That's not a, that's, I mean, that's not a quorum. It's not a meeting. Um, and we could come back and say, we talked and we both think we should keep meetings to four hours. Right, Commissioner Lee? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, so I just want, I want to highlight the fact that you know, we would need to, if we were going to create a working group, we would need to put that on the agenda. We would need to vote. And then when we did that, we would create a staff responsibility to support notice agenda and meeting. On the other hand, if we, if we work independently, um, you know, uh, w with no more than three, we can work to bring forward information. Um, and I think it really depends on um, what the will of the commission is in terms of do we want to have specific, and, and I guess I'm thinking again, you know, I'm putting a lot on the September meeting, that once we have our work plan for the coming year and we know what our resources are, then we're going to know what we need to do to to support and fill in for for any missing links and that that might be a good time for us then to decide on a working group what that was and 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 whether or not there are the resources to support another agenda notice and public hearing process so um but i i hear you there is a lot of work to do and um, if we needed to do it that way, we, we have that option. As Andrew said, it's not that they're just protocols. It's not a question of not being allowed to, to meet that way. But as I understand it, that's if we were to formally create a working group. But if there was if a- I, If I say it as the chair or executive director Pelham asked people to meet in that fashion, I'm pretty sure that's what triggers a policy body formation under the Sunshine Ordinance. And I think maybe we lost Andrew, no, Andrew's still there. Um, 
Andrew, if, is that correct? It's the manner in which the group is created. Yeah, that's correct, Chair Ambrose. It's really if the commission is taking some sort of official action to create the committee. And I'm not even sure it's just the commission. I'm pretty sure that if the chair does it, but I can't remember the Sunshine Ordinance. I used to have it memorized, but it's slipped my mind. <laughs> Well, that's to be if you to write the sunshine for us. Um, in any event, uh, but we will bring that back on September when we're when we're doing all of the other forward-looking work. That's one of the things that we'll look at. I just wanted to put that that sort of you know parameters around what that would in, entail, so that we understand what that means to to do that. Um, as opposed to maybe having volunteers or something. So I mean, I, and when I'm thinking in terms of some specific picture of it, it would be like if we were to discuss commissioners doing fundraising outside the commission process, you know, trying to obtain money for the commission to get its work done. Mm -hmm. What if you had two commissioners and they, one of them says, I'm going to look at people who are uh, in the habit of funding uh, transparency and disclosures. And another commissioner said, but I know uh, enforcement and policy writing. And so there's two different points of view and they would have together provided enough information to at least begin a resource library of where you could go to obtain additional funding. Right. And I, I, again, I hear that. Um, and I, as I had noted earlier in the, I'd asked Deputy City Attorney Shen and also the Executive Director in September to speak to what is involved in soliciting outside funds. I mean, that, in my mind, it assumes, um, because I've processed a lot of grant funding applications for departments over the years, there, you know, there is a, there's a, something specific, a deliverable that's associated with eliciting support from outside agencies. There's usually a contract. There's a usually an indemnity clause that say that you're not going to sue the San Francisco Foundation if somebody is in a car accident while working on the project. You know, so there's um, there are protocols around that. So I wanted um, as part of that. I know you're just using it by way of example, but it's also something that. Um, that we've discussed and is, you know, enticing certainly in the circumstances we find ourselves. So um, in September, and I will work with you, uh, Director Bellum, to try and structure the agenda so that these things all come together in some manner in which we have the knowledge for purposes of the discussion. Um, we'll talk about uh, what's, what's involved in terms of the city process for um, getting outside funding support. And it doesn't have to be money. I mean, Alex, Alex Clemens brought his whole class in to do an analysis of uh, campaign funding uh -huh. uh, made recommendations to the commission, many of which were adopted. It was a, it was a class project. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, so there are a variety of approaches to add resources to the work of the commission. Okay. All right. I have one other issue for a uh, future agenda, and that is uh, uh, to elevate the issue of how we def define lobbying. Uh, and for example, uh, permit letters don't follow under lobbying things. 501c4 groups do not fall under lobbying. So we need to take a look at whether or not in today's world, those groups should be viewed as atheist unless they're providing services to uh, individuals or communities, but not simply uh, acting on behalf of an issue. Like the National, National Rifle Association is a nonprofit. Should they be a lobby if they're in here lobbying to make sure that we have uh, stores that can still sell the guns? You can certainly argue that they should be listed that way. So to make sure that I understand as a substantive matter, 
I mean, that would be something that we would be looking at legislatively. Um, and, and also, we're supposed to do at least one lobby audit a year. Mm -hmm. Right. Ahead. I was going to say maybe um, I don't know, uh, Director Pelham or um, Mr. Ford, if you um, I, I don't I don't want to presume what um, you're going to bring forward as staff in September under the policy prioritization plan. But if you heard the issue that Commissioner Bush raised and you are able to provide feedback or comment or some discussion about um, that topic, um, I think appropriate. And um, we're not going to talk about it substantively now because it's actually not on the agenda except for to raise it for future discussion. So with that, actually, if you are concluding your remarks, Mr. Bush, and don't see any other hands raised about new business, I am going to ask the monitor to uh, see if we have any public comment on this agenda item. Madam Chair, we are checking to see if there are callers in the queue. For those already on hold, please continue to wait until the system indicates you have been unmuted. If you have just joined this meeting, we are currently taking public comment on agenda item number 11, discussion and possible action on items for future meetings. If you have not already done so, please press star three to be added to the public comment queue. You will have three minutes to provide your public comment, six minutes if you, have, if you are online with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please continue to stand by. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. All right, then public comment is closed on uh, number 12, or no, 11. 11. And I'm um, going to call item 12, our last item, additional opportunity for public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda pursuant to Ethics Commission bylaws, Article 7, Section 2. Members of the public who are already on the line and wish to speak should now dial star three, if you've not already done so, to be added to the public comment line. Uh, Mr. Moderator, would you please proceed with public comment if there are any speakers on the line? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, hold on, I, <laughs> excuse me, Chair. <laughs> we are now look, checking to see if they, we have callers in the queue. Right on agenda item number twelve. Yeah, that I'm I'm so I'm got a little got a little sidetracked here. This thing was kind of okay. Uh, the ex commission now receiving public comment on agenda item number twelve remotely in this meeting. Each member of the public will have up to three minutes to provide public comment. Six minutes. If you are in line with if you are online with an interpreter, you will hear a bell go off when you have thirty seconds remaining. If you joined the the meeting earlier to listen to the proceedings, now is the time to get in line to speak. If you haven't already done so, please press star three. It's important that you press star three. Uh, please stand by. Chair, there are no callers in the queue. Madam Chair, there are no callers in the queue. All right, then public comment is closed on agenda item 12. And um, we're on to agenda item 13, which would be adjournment. Um, commissioners, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second from Commissioner Bush. Um, on the motion moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Moderator, will you please call the roll? A motion has been made and second to adjourn the meeting. I will now call the roll. Commissioner Bush. Yes. Commissioner Chu. Yes. Vice Chair Lee. 
Aye. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Chair Ambrose. Yes, and thank you all for um, meeting my time. My sister's birthday party awaits me on Zoom. Um, and I look forward to our very busy meeting in September and I wish you staff all the best. I mean, we're I'm available and on standby to support you as we get through the budget um, process and then uh, certainly let us know when you see something uh, scheduled um, for government audit on the um, BLA report. Um, I know myself and maybe some of the other commissioners might actually want to certainly want to observe and may want to call in. Um, so thanks again. Um, you all have a nice weekend. Stay cool. Remember. Stay cool and stay safe. <laughs> right. Take care, everyone. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.